Perhaps we should add some music in the background as we were waiting to come together. We're going to get started here just shortly. Uh, we're going to start right at nine o'clock out of respect for your time and in recognition that we're tight on time. It is that hour. Let's get started. Let's go to that next slide, Jesse. So good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to have you with us this morning uh, as we begin our first ever Equity Summit here at the College of Marin featuring all of our equity programs. So while we are getting started, um, I invite you to go to the chat box and to just enter one word that uh, describes how you're feeling about today's Equity Summit. And we'll get a sense of, of who's out there and, and how folks are feeling today. Uh, we are assisted by the ever-talented Jesse Klein, who works in the President's Office, the also ever-talented Nicole Cruz, who is our Director of Marketing and Communication. And we're also joined by Karen Chan today. She's a graphic recorder, uh, and you'll get to see her work as, as the day progresses and certainly during our uh, breaks as well. And a special thanks ahead of time to all of our presenters who, with everything else going on, managed to prepare today and, and not only their presentations, but we've asked them to enter their presentations into a one doc drive to memorialize the good work that's happening. And so we can also have a look at that, um, be able to use that data and information for all good things going forward. Uh, please be advised that the event is being recorded and captioning is provided by ICS, Internet Captioning Service. For captioning, please click on the ICS link in the chat box. So as I stated in our invitation to, uh, to the summit, I've thought for some time that we have long needed to create a space where we all could come together to hear from each other, to hear, about, hear from you specifically about the incredible equity work we are doing on behalf of our students and community. To better understand how this important work connects to our mission and our educational master plan, to identify opportunities for further collaboration, to see where we might be able to better leverage resources, to gain a better understanding of how we create and communicate a message that best describes the reach and impact of this work. And of course, this should also be a celebration of the great work that's underway, as well as the work that's in the pipeline. So please recall uh, that our 2019, uh, excuse me, 2019, 2025 educational master plan includes equity as a focus area. And while it was previously a assume, I think, that equity is embedded in, our, in all of our work, um, really, it, we really weren't looking at equity through the lens, uh, as all the, the, through the lens of equity with everything that we're doing. So uh, we have done that to collectively uh, to hold ourselves to a higher standard uh, by viewing things through the, equity, the lens of equity. Uh, as a reminder, and I'll ask uh, Jesse to move to the slide where we've got our definition of equity that we adopted. I'll take a quick look there. And then we also uh, adopted a definition of equity minded, and you can have a look there as well. And then we have our three areas of our educational master plan, which included three specific goals for equity, and you can see those. Yes, you can move through those. Okay, so let's get at this. Uh, many of you have seen the variations of our presentation schedule, and, and as I mentioned, we have 13 presentations today. Some presentations will focus on just one program or initiative, while others will cover various initiatives. There were 10 prompts provided to the presenters, and I imagine some folks will stick to the prompts, while others may uh, expand beyond. Each presentation has up to 15 minutes. As a timekeeper, I will provide you with a five minute warning and a one minute warning prior to the end of your 15 minute period presentation period. For those not presenting, you will see the presenter, the presentation, and you have the option to see our graphic recorder. The graphic recorder, as I mentioned, will be spotlighted during our two breaks. Please pose any questions you have in the chat box. We have a very limited time, but if there is time left for questions in the time allotted, we will move to question and answer. If not, we will save the questions and ask the presenters to respond to those questions in the OneDrive document that we've created. 
So with that, with the instructions, I will only be introducing the lead presenter, if you will, for lack of a better word, and then ask them to make the, uh, the introductions of their other panelists. So with that, if we are ready to get started, first up is school and community partnerships. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuhn. And as Juan is helping to load our slides, Thank you, Juan. Good morning. On behalf of the School and Community Partnerships team, we're honored to participate in this important convening. Putting this presentation together afforded us the time to reflect on how our mission has grown when outreach and school relations was reframed as school and community partnerships and how equity officially became the context for our work. We've chosen a Venn diagram to illustrate the range and more importantly, the intersectionality of our work with local schools and community partners. And how aside from our student services responsibilities ranging from information sessions, campus tours, career fairs, to onboarding and navigational support, we also have participated in the development, implementation and coordination of two college access programs. COMPASS, which stands for College of Marin, providing access and supporting success, and Summer Bridge, our transition program that builds early success for graduating seniors who are entering COM. The genesis for both of these programs grew from the recognition of our responsibility to help close the opportunity gaps that have existed for students who are largely the first in their families to attend college and who are underrepresented and under-resourced. The equity, strategic, and educational master plans all act as our Northern Stars, ensuring that equity is at the center of everything we do and our partnerships hold us accountable for our common mission and shared fate. Our team consists of eight student ambassadors who act as super peers, providing their authentic voices and experiences on and off campus, as well as a team of four full-time program coordinators who lead our summer bridge and compass programs. It's now my pleasure to introduce our three compass coordinators, Liliana Barajas, Juan Mercado, and Nigel Hakens Apia who will share their work at the high schools. Hello everyone, my name is Nigel. Um, we're happy to be here to share an overview of the program and how it fits within the larger College of Marine uh, equity effort. So Compass started in 2016 in response to troubling uh, education trends within the county. Educational data showed that students of color and students from low income backgrounds were significantly behind their peers in several categories namely college and career readiness, college enrollment, and college completion. Thus, COMPASS, an equity-oriented four-year dual enrollment program, was created to address these stark disparities in education. As for the process, we meet our students in the eighth grade for recruitment. We have developed relationships with our feeder middle schools who help us identify eligible students who are first generation, low income and underrepresented backgrounds. However, we start working with our students in a high touch level beginning in the ninth grade and follow them through their years in high school. During their time in the Compass program, students participate in workshops and one-on-one -on -one advising with some key highlights like our ninth grade field trip when we bring our students to our Kentfield campus, taking counseling 115 and 125 at their high school site taught by a comp counselor in the 10th grade and we help our 12th grade students with college and financial aid applications. We also encourage our students to participate in our summer career academies and challenge them to take and earn college credits by concurrently enrolling at COM classes. Lastly, for those students who decide to attend COM full-time for after graduating, receive a two-year scholarship, which helps cover tuition, fees, textbooks, and any other required uh, class materials requested by the instructor. Compass is part of the college pathways and every Compass student will graduate with college credits by enrolling in a summer career academy or concurrent enrollment class. Uh, and there's an expectation for them uh, to attend Summer Bridge, EOPS, if they qualify, enroll in a learning community and internships when they get to College of Marin, which will eventually help them transfer to a four-year institution um, at a faster rate. All right, so when Compass was conceived, these metrics were identified as meaningful ways to measure the effectiveness of the program. 
Um, academic research regularly, regularly acknowledges these areas as powerful indicators of future academic success and progress. By addressing these areas, Compass aims to move the needle of equity within Marin County's K-12 systems by ensuring that students from disadvantaged backgrounds are given intentional support in their academic journeys. While our program goals are lofty, Compass continues to make progress towards these goals through an iterative approach to program design. Picture on these slides are graphs to illustrate some of our program goals. 53% of our most recent graduating cohort were A through G eligible, which is a California requirement to apply to a four-year university. 95% of our cohort enrolled in a higher ed institution upon graduation, with 64% coming to calm. We're also seeing the number of CCP units earned by our program members trend upwards. For program resources, uh, we have full, three full-time campus coordinators who case manage, um, or we case manage approximately 250 students. Uh, we currently hold monthly cross-site grade level meetings and have one-on-one -on -one appointments with our students. We also collaborate with our high school teachers, administration, and staff to provide a better experience for our students. In addition, three of our uh, College of Marin counselors teach our campus counseling classes, which total up to six counseling units per academic year across three high school sites. We are in the planning process to restart the program at San Marino and Nevada High Schools um, in order to increase the number of students that we serve. Uh, with that, we will need to bring four additional counseling units uh, and a part-time campus coordinator. We would also like to um, increase our university field trips to local um, and local colleges and universities. And we would also like to extend that to do an overnight college field trip for our students to Southern California. Um, and we would also like to implement a one week summer transitional program for middle school students coming into the campus program where we can involve the parents and help them explore math and science concepts with the hands-on activities in order to increase uh, knowledge retention over the summer. And to highlight some of our students, I have the privilege of working with Marco Aguirre, who graduated from Terra Linda High School in 2019. He graduated with a total of 26.5 college credits, which most were in math, and that is why he is now majoring and studying um, math at CSU Long Beach. Um, after graduating from a graduate program, he hopes to work in a community college as a math instructor, and recently he was just hired through SAS as a math tutor and is excited to support our current students. And while we love to see our Compass students thrive and meet our stated uh, program goals, our primary goal is to move the needle and empower students in their academic journeys. Cheyenne Hansia is a current senior at Tamil Pius High School. According to his family and high school counselors, Cheyenne has made a complete 180 since his ninth grade year and developed into an, uh, an, an engaged and motivated student. Having overcome various personal challenges, Cheyenne will enroll in Calm this summer participate in Summer Bridge, and continue his academic journey with the support of Compass, EOPS, and the Calm Learning Communities. Thank you, Compass Coordinators, for ending with such inspiring student stories and for the care and support you provide your students and their families. And now, Julian Solis, our School and Community Partnerships Coordinator, will tell us about the impact that Summer Bridge has had in preparing graduating seniors for college success. Julian? Yeah, thank you, Anna. Summer Bridge is a three week, one unit academic and college success counseling course. Uh, it includes math and English review portions and new in 2020, uh, we added an ESL review and support uh, cohort as well. Uh, Summer Bridge provides college success strategies, community building, confidence building and navigational skills for our incoming students. And overall, these students are more prepared to start their educational journeys at Calm. Uh, they're more connected to their peers and also the programs and resources available to them and our staff and faculty. What started as a small pilot program in 2014 that uh, saw 24 students complete the program has steadily grown year to year. Uh, we're, we're starting the planning for 2021 and that's the aim that, that we have now to surpass these numbers, serve more students um, and go from there really. In the case of our Latinx students, uh, one of the target populations is Summer Bridge and just our, our equity efforts as a whole. Summer Bridge students are persisting 
into their second semester at a higher rate. They're enrolling and completing more units and they're persisting on a higher rate to their second year at Com, as compared to other students that have not taken part in Summer Bridge. Some of the highlights in, of our 2020 program. So we transitioned to a full online delivery. I mentioned the launch of our ESL pilot program and I'll talk about that shortly. We saw 141 students complete the program and all these students were provided the choice of a laptop or a book grant to use at the Com Bookstore and also an additional $300 scholarship. Uh, at the start of the fall 2020 semester, 135 of these students were enrolled in some capacity at Com. And the vast majority of these students are coming from Marin, uh, the feeder high schools in the area. Five minutes. The, the ESL program was launched uh, after uh, working with and listening to our high school partners, where uh, we were hearing that they had more and more students that were graduating or aging out of the high schools, uh, needing additional English support. So this ESL portion allows students to continue their English language acquisition uh, building and throughout the summer. And especially those students that are non-residents uh, have this time count towards their in-state tuition uh, time requirements. And Summer Bridge really is a program of collaboration because uh, it, it doesn't happen because of our office or myself. It happens because of all of us on and off campus as well, our partners on and off campus. 10,000 degrees instrumental in being able to help us deliver the program every summer. Uh, Marin Promise has been, has been great in their support uh, as well. And different offices like enrollment services, student services, counseling, EOPS, uh, the different learning communities, Umoja, MAPS, Puente, uh, SAS, Athletics, ESL. Uh, they all have opportunities to get in front of these students, meet them, connect with them, and, and let them know about the different resources available to them on campus. As far as like the allocated resources now, uh, quite a bit of my time is spent in, in in not just planning and helping with the planning, but also being there for the delivery of the program. Uh, traditionally, we've offered lunch to all these students every single year outside of, of 2020. Uh, we've had, in 2020, we had six units uh, of counseling allocated for the program. And that included uh, four, four English uh, faculty stipends, uh, four math or STEM uh, instructor stipends as well, and two ESL instructor stipends. We've had uh, summer bridge ambassadors. So we had four students that were able to join us and help us uh, in the summer as well. It, it, summer bridge has been, has been a great program so far. Like I said, the planning for 2020 has started. We're, we're well underway with that. Uh, but we also see some future opportunities where we think we can grow. Uh, 2020 saw us deliver this, this, this program online and quite a few of the students enjoyed the flexibility offered of being online. Um, of those remote classes. We wanna continue our work with, our, with the learning communities, further embed our, our work with them um, and continue to act as a feeder bridge to those programs, right? Not just the learning communities, but programs like EOPS and SAS. And then we wanna, uh, we've explored the expanding the ESL offerings where uh, we, again, we're hearing from our community and high school partners that this is a growing population in the county uh, and and we, we know and we, we know that this is a group that we can continue to serve. And then we're, we're also starting to explore a short late, late summer offering, uh, potentially in August, right before the start of the fall semester, um, serving those students that, you know what, just don't have the time during the summer, but getting them this information, getting them connected uh, right before they start in, in the fall. Thank you to Julian for being a guiding force for Summer Bridge, in addition to his work as the School and Community Partnerships Coordinator. In closing, our partnership work provides the extra horsepower and important inroads and opportunities to address the opportunity gaps that exist, especially in Marin City, the Canal area in San Rafael, and parts of Novato. We know that when we stand with our equity partners, such as Marin Promise, 10,000 Degrees, Canal Alliance, Community Action Marin, and others, we deepen our impact among prospective students. Our continuum of support requires thoughtful, deliberate, and cohesive strategies and partnership because we cannot do this work alone. And it allows us to sustain our support for students 
along their academic careers so that they are able to benefit fully from the community college value proposition and achieve their educational goals. Thank you all for this opportunity to share our work. Terrific, thank you. I hear thunderous applause out there. Uh, in, in lieu, perhaps of, of thunderous applause, if there's any, uh, this great commentary in the chat, very affirming uh, messages. Uh, I encourage folks to use the chat as, as a way of giving feedback as well. Um, I originally thought that I was only going to give limited feedback, like thank you, because sometimes if I'm less effusive with other groups, people read too much into it. But I can't help but being, you know, in, enthused and happy about what I just heard. So great work, thank you all very much, and great thanks for being the perfect starting example for keeping on time and keeping it moving along. So and responding to all of the prompts, that was great. So again, big round of applause to our first presenters. So with that, we're going to transition and have our next group. I, I should have said I. Anna and team, Anna Pillitson and team, I indicated I introduced the lead presenter and I failed to do that, but Anna and team, thank you very much. So next up we have, uh, I believe actually the lead on this was Paul Dobbenmeyer with the STEM learning community, or perhaps it's Carol Hernandez. Let's start with Carol and then we'll, we'll go to Paul. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Um, first, I just wanna say thank you for holding this summit. Um, I'm proud to work at an institution where equity is uh, a priority. Um, today, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dobbenmeyer, our STEM Learning Community Coordinator. Um, as most of you know, we started a STEM Learning Community um, fall of 2019, just before COVID. Uh, we started the Learning Community because we wanted to diversify our STEM pipeline so that all of our students have the opportunity to enter the workforce. Uh, we didn't want to do this to check some box. Um, this initiative, this program is important because a diverse work STEM workforce is a stronger workforce. Um, today, uh, Paul's going to share some of our successes, uh, where we are today, and our plans for the future. So please join me in welcoming one of the most thoughtful people that I know, Dr. Paul Dobbenmeyer. Thank you, Carol, for that introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, I'm about to uh, share a little video that one of our students made. I, I think it will be quite um, touching to see her experience um, as uh, a, a member of our learning community. I'll start sharing that one more time. Um, apologies. Okay. And here we go. Hi, my name is Olaiklet Piccinini, and I was a College of Marine student for the summer of 2016 until the spring of 2020. And I am majoring in cognitive science and minoring in data science. I'm here today to share my experiences as part of the STEM learning community of College of Marin and to tell you what you should expect after joining. As part of the community, I joined study groups and connected with students. I attended to scholarship presentations that taught me how to apply to these scholarships and helped me land a scholarship of $30,000 to cover my academic expenses. I was mentored by faculty members that help me take actionable steps towards my end goal of becoming a data scientist and they gave me career guidance and were interested in my goal. So I was provided with a list of summer internships to which I applied to after my mentor helped me review my application and I was able to get an internship with the Northern Arizona University, a paid internship. I was able to learn how to code in Python. I was also able to use Data Query and discovered the provisional shape of an asteroid that goes around the sun every 319 years. Being in this community allowed me to hear stories from women in science through the STEM speaker series and also through the collaboration of the women in tech. This community is an absolutely incredible resource for you and your STEM career. And if you want to learn more or are curious about it, please do not hesitate to reach out to Dr. Dobbenmeyer and Dr. Kukiata 
and take an opportunity to be part of it. So that video produced by one of our students um, obviously is targeting um, her fellow students, but surely gives a good insight into the type of experience she had as a member of the STEM learning community. I'm, um, I'm particularly encouraged by the joy she had in her face when she talks about the asteroid that she studied. You can see that really ignited her. And um, so I'd like to just uh, share a couple slides here and talk through some of the um, work we've done with our STEM learning community. As uh, Carol mentioned, we are one of the younger or newer um, equity-minded resources on campus, but um, that doesn't mean we haven't been very active. And to that, I really thank the um, administration and, and Carol's work as, as well as um, uh, all the allocation, this little picture up in the upper middle is actually the picture of our STEM learning community space. Uh, the day of fall 2019 semester opened, you can see it's it's bare. But my slogan was if you build it, they will come. And sure enough, um, there's just some pictures going around of in the upper right, uh, packing it out for internship presentations. And on the far left, we had the women in tech ask me anything chat with Maria Colson um, event. Um, lower left, we decided when the we discovered when the weather gets good, we can actually spill out into that very nice um, little outdoor courtyard. And we set up um, some pizza for one of our speaker series and accommodated about 70 people that night. Coincidentally, that was the I believe the last big event on our campus, March 9th, 2020, before we kind of uh, shut down and went to distance learning mode. So there on the lower right, you can see Marjorie Chan, we'll talk about her in just a second, um, giving a presentation there in that space. And down in the middle, just wanted to point out how important whiteboards are uh, for common creation of information. That's one thing we're losing in the Zoom age sometimes. And there's the output of one of our faculty brown bag lunches where we came together during the calm hour, that community hour that had just been launched that fall. All our faculty were free and we all met together with our lunches and just brainstormed different strategies specific to uh, being successful in STEM. And so these were some of the uses that have come out of the physical space that was provided. And I'm really excited about the new Learning Resource Center and all those spaces that are gonna open up. Um, looking forward to hearing how teams will be uh, advancing through, through access to that space. So just a quick overview, our, our goal with the STEM learning community is to link specific STEM opportunities, both at COM and beyond to our first generation students, those who are traditionally underrepresented in STEM fields, which often includes uh, female scientists in, in some of the really uh, traditionally male dominated um, scientific fields, and to connect those resources to students who might not typically seek them out. Um, we do this through the work of uh, providing these internship workshops, mentoring opportunities, uh, career opportunities that already exist at COM, speaker series, and also social events like movie nights and pizza nights. And I'll, I'll just say my personal goal is that every student I come in contact with through the STEM learning community, I connect to every resource and opportunity that they are, are looking for. Now that's, that's a lot to say, but as we know this morning, we are a wealth of resources. And I, uh, again, I, I'm thankful to all the work that has been done by everyone who's presenting this morning, because it makes my job a connecting job, not a creating job. And I think that's part of our work uh, is to break down that, those barriers of just connecting to existing resources. So uh, I'm, I'm the, uh, the coordinator. I give a big shout out and thanks to Dr. Nino Cucciara. He's, uh, he joined our faculty in fall of 19, right around the launch of the STEM learning community has been influential in uh, connecting with the Umoja learning community and also in bringing in his expertise at working at HBCU. Um, and so I'm looking forward as our collaboration goes 
um, to the strengths he brings. We also have Dorian Carlisle, who's been invaluable on staff um, to help support many of the logistic events. And then I'll mention a little bit more just about all those, the math and science and STEM faculty who've given themselves to some of our efforts. So just a little demographic info, when we first launched until March 9th, 2020, we had uh, 52 students fill out our demographic survey, which was pretty much our en enrollment participation into the community. Uh, I'll point out statistically, we have 41% of those are first generation uh, college students. There's other some demographic data that we haven't fully parsed yet. But my goal was to meet face to face with each one of those students. And so during that about eight month period, um, I reached about 80% of them to talk about their trajectory as STEM majors, some in the very early stages of being STEM curious, some in their third year about to transfer um, to a, a UC or a CSU and tried to understand what are the, some of the factors or pressures affecting um, students, just like the groundwork you all have done um, from before. And what I re realized, and I didn't put this stat up, was the incredible number of students who joined who were already being supported by an existing learning community. And that showed the strength that we have on our campus, um, that we have this overlap and we're reaching students from many different angles. Then, of course, the pandemic hit and our en enrollees dropped tremendously um, due to kind of our, our model of reaching people in a face-to-face -face way. It was very difficult, obviously, to kind of make new connections. We did uh, find a way to basically tag on with faculty members and ask them if we could join the last five minutes of their lecture and give little presentations. And actually through that, we were able to get about 22 new enrollees. And then we've pivoted and we've not gone full bore with that model now, um, reaching classes where we'll give three, again, three to 10 minute presentations just at the end of a lecture. And out of that, we now have 153 cumulative Canvas enrollees. Some are more active than others, but we're trying to use social media as a way for people to stay connected. And we realize um, people don't want to log on to more Zooms than they need to. Um, and sometimes the spaces we create are digital. And so we're trying to vary those in a way that keeps students engaged. A little bit about the STEM speaker series. Again, we feel this is a way to bring the community of faculty, staff, students, and even the greater Marin community together. And on that talk on March 9th, we had about 70 attendees um, in that evening session, including um, retired executives, retired directors um, in positions at universities um, who are in the comm community and were curious about how they could re reconnect. Um, Dr. Chan was a, uh, the daughter of one of our former faculty members years ago and a community college student herself. And so it was quite engaging and it really sparked our consideration. So over the last six months we're plotting and planning and now we have a speaker series lined up of about eight different um, presenters uh, which started on february 3rd with dr farisa morales from nasa jet propulsion lab and we just heard about the the rover that landed yesterday well that um, was basically from th that same lab and she gave her very um emp empowering testimonial of just her childhood and her upbringing and every aspect of what it takes to be a Latina who makes it in science at the highest level. And um, I encourage you, we'll, I have that link available for go back and watch it. It really opened up my eyes to some of the challenges, both externally that we're aware of, but also internally that happens in a young woman who's put forth in kind of this environment that doesn't typically promote um, someone like her to advance. So it was um, we're having these kind of speakers come in who are quite engaging and are at the level of our students to inspire and motivate them. Um, so just a little bit more, I just wanted to point out, we also did a, a, a kind of a radical experiment. We asked faculty members in STEM to shift their office hours from being in their actual office to down to where the students were. And this kind of demystified what a faculty student interaction was like. This allowed people to talk about what they're having for lunch, what they were doing or did last weekend. And it broke down the barriers, this mystique of 
uh, a professor and how we got to be professors. And what this actually helped to do was inspire our students for the next slide I'll show you um, to apply for the internships and the scholarships that we had available to them. So we had five in the, in the fall and then six in the spring have their office hours in the STEM community. And you'll see as a result, um, we doubled the number of um, the successful internship applicants as well as recipients. So we would just um, wanted to promote that Basically, we're, we're all doing this already, but in our fields with the faculty to kind of change their approach to high touch opportunities with students. A couple of the partnerships we've been able to engage with was there was a grant from the state of California for some professional development. Um, Silicon Valley Women in Engineering Conference provides networking opportunities. The scholarships mentioned, the internships are all mentioned there. Genentech I'll mention is a kind of a burgeoning partnership right now. And then the comm collaborators were still young, so we haven't had a chance to collaborate with everyone, but we just thank everyone on this list for the conversations we've all had that have enriched our work. And then just wanted to close with this momentum. Um, these yellow blocks are areas that we have ha have access to and building towards a, a MESA center or a MESA model. So we'd like to build out towards those. So we're positioned to apply for funding for that in the next two or three years. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you all today and look forward to the presentations. Terrific, thank you very much, Paul and Carol. Uh, again, fantastic presentation. I'm, I'm hoping you're all pulling the nuggets out of your best practices about how, how to engage with students and so forth. So again, uh, short of not being able to hear, hear the thunderous applause, folks, please add your, your positive feedback and kudos in the chat box. Uh, and any questions, again, of the presenters, you can include in the chat box. We'll make sure that they get them and then we include the responses to those questions in their OneDrive document. We're doing great on time, folks. Thanks very much. We're gonna move right along to uh, the Academic Senate and uh, Meg Pascal. So, hi, everybody. Uh, this is already great. I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. I'm here today to present some initiatives through the auspices of the Academic Senate. And the first one I'm going to hit you with is our Faculty Diversity Internship Program. And this is being spearheaded by Kristen Perrone, Patty France, Paul Cheney, and I am helping them. Um, what it is, is we are really looking to have a homegrown program that is going to help us diversify our, uh, our candidates for faculty positions. Uh, we, will, we are proposing that we will help prepare uh, graduate students of color to be part of the uh, college of community college community and also to prepare for the hiring process. Um, it's going to be across disciplines so that every discipline could have an intern. There will be workshops to work on variety of things, which I'll get to a little bit more later. We're gonna be able to target departments that could use diversification and instructors and students all benefit. As you see here, um, under goal two, we are looking under equity goal two, we are looking to hire support and retain equity minded employees that are reflective of the diversity of the students. And this is one step towards that. In addition, this will also create opportunities for faculty to collaborate, which is our instructional programs goal five. Um, we do have some existing resources for this. We wrote an IR&D and this has provided us with the means to do the planning, uh, create marketing contact, to develop the workshops, to execute through this and through some of the recruitment. However, to make this an institutionalized program, there will be yearly resources needed. Uh, there, uh, as you see here, 50,000 for 10 mentees, 100,000 for 10 mentors, and 10,000 for one coordinator. And so you'll see that the price tag is $160,000 every year. I wanted to be clear about that. Um, so this program would target graduate students of color and bring them onto campus with a faculty mentor. And they would be here for a whole year and they would have some real hands-on opportunity to work with a variety of, of different areas of including curriculum, pedagogy, uh, service to the district. And as you can see here, 
it will be closely aligned with many things, uh, pedagogical innovation, uh, the Umoja Equity Institute would certainly be part of this. We are looking for connections with another workshop, which I'll present, the curriculum decolonization. Um, it also intersects with our new faculty mentor program, which I'll be telling you about. Program review is affected by this and our professional learning. Um, we do have uh, some needs. We'll need some marketing materials and human resources will be onboarding our interns. Um, we're gonna need help with recruiting and we're hoping that the administration will reach out to their partners. Uh, we'll need to talk about UPM for the future of our interns and how they can become part of our part-time pool system. Um, faculty will, uh, will require participation to be mentors and guide our interns through the process. Uh, we'll also be using um, data, and so PRE will be a partnership. And as you know, we are seeking institutionalized funding for this. Um, the long view is really to create our own pipeline so that we can indeed have faculty that represent the diversity of our student body. Um, this will, of course, engender student success uh, because representation matters. We will have a clearer and more articulated teaching philosophy among the participants, which of course will help guide our culture of pedagogical inquiry and adhering to best practices. Um, I, I also see quite a few connections with the Te Teaching Institute, which is one of our goals in the Educational Master Plan. And we are hoping that uh, eventually our students, when they get their master's degree, will be coming back and be teachers here at College of Marin. The second program I wanna to introduce to you is Decolonizing Curriculum, a workshop that I am working on with David King and Patricia Siri. Um, it's basically a way to reimagine instruction. Um, it's a way for us to look into our curriculum, um, into our classroom practices, into the way that we assess and give assignments to our students. So really it's soup to nuts. It's a, it's a three to four day workshop. We're still fine tuning it. But as you can see here, it um, meets, it coincides with goal number one, which is eliminating racial equity gaps. And it also works very closely with the actual, um, the uh, indicators, which are using disaggregated data having greater professional development and to ensure that there are data-driven changes to programs here on campus. Um, we do have existing resources. Once again, we created an IR&D and this has helped us plan um, and to execute to have the program ready to go. We, are, we have created the workshop content and we will also be recruiting. However, there will be yearly resources needed as you can see here, I have a list and the grand total, which I shan't leave you in, suspe in suspense, is $80,000 a year approximately. Um, we do have many intersections here. Uh, ideally, we will eventually make this part of our curriculum review cycle. So this program would have a shorter term shelf life, if you will, once we embed it into our, year, our five year review cycle and curriculum. Of course, this will also connect with the faculty diversity in internship uh, as they will be participating in pieces of the workshop. It intersects with better pedagogy, innovation, professional learning, program review, and with the Emoja Equity Institute. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Sorry. There we go. Um, once again, it takes a village. So we will need some materials for the workshops. We're counting on faculty and their local expertise to facilitate these workshops. We're also counting on faculty to participate. Uh, PRE will be part of this as we will be looking at disaggregated data for each of our courses in order to better analyze the existing issues and uh, troubleshoot them. Uh, once again, we'll rely on the curriculum committee to become part of their regular review cycle, and we will need institutionalized funding. Um, 
the long view is that it will be institutionalized. So once it becomes part of our curriculum review, uh, the program will just be housed there. Uh, this will help us in student success in a number of ways. Uh, when students are engaged and the content is culturally responsive to our students, it engenders success. Um, it's also going to allow us to work in cohorts to examine and embrace and understand best practices and to really up our game with cultural engagement and move away from the Western centric canon that is um, part of curriculum across all institutes of higher learning. Um, the third program I'd like to tell you about is our new faculty mentor program. Uh, when we have new faculty coming in, the Academic Senate has been providing mentors for them. So we have a faculty cohort. Right now we are at seven as we have seven new full-time employees. And they are being ably led by three mentors who were not so long ago newcomers themselves. And they have provided an amazing program wherein they are able to connect with various resources on campus, meet various con constituents, um, learn about our very particular bureaucracy, um, and also explore the opportunities that are available on campus. And of course, it is forming community, not just with our new cohort, our new faculty cohort, but with other members of the community at large. Um, this, of course, is steeped in equity. One of our goals is to uh, retain our equity-minded employees and this uh, creating a place for them to be and to interact is absolutely doing that. This also, of course, addresses uh, IP goal number five, which is collaboration between faculty members but more important than the letter, this really embraces the spirit of equity. We are, what we're really talking about with all of the programs I'm presenting is changing our culture. Um, and in order to change the culture, we have to get participation and create a community which would be uh, conducive to such a thing. Um, there are, as always, there are challenges. Um, scheduling can be difficult with everybody's disparate uh, obligations. And of course, we have the support from our constituents have been showing up to Zoom meetings with them. This allows the, the newcomers to understand options at the college and the dedication of our, um, of our mentors has really been exemplary. Um, right now, these are being uh, written with uh, uh, IRD calls through UDWC, uh, but we would like to find permanent resources for this program. The last one I'm going to tell you about is our program review equity facilitators. As you know, we changed our program review to make it more thoughtful and to make it more conducive to the changes we want to see happen across, across our, um, our uh, offerings and curriculum. And so with a new method, we decided that some facilitation and guidance is always a good idea. And so we have recruited two amazing equity facilitators who are not only walking our departments through the procedural changes which have been instituted, but they're also facilitating conversations and keeping it interactive and creating the culture of inquiry that we wanna see happen in our program review. Remembering that always we, it is a lens of equity and anti-racism. Um, once again, this coincides with various goals on our, in our equity master plan. As you can see here, it's gonna help close equity gaps. It'll actually result in innovative offerings and it is collaboration between uh, faculty members across disciplines. And it also embraces the spirit of our uh, educational master plan in that it aims to change our culture through guided participation and as always, it will be based on disaggregated data so that we are consciously looking at our students who have been historically disenfranchised. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to assess our own work based on data. Um, it's been, scheduling can be a little difficult once again, 
especially when we're talking about whole departments meeting. But the participation has really been fabulous in our rollout. And I want to thank all of the departments that have gone through it so far uh, for their dedication and for their willingness to engage in such a process. And once again, we have been putting out calls for our amazing facilitators, but we would like to see these resources made permanent in order to continue the good work. And with that, I am done. Terrific, thank you. Oops, am I, oh, there we are. Terrific, thank you, Meg. Such transformative work among the faculty. We so we appreciate that. After each of these presentations, I've been, I'm continuing to learn from each of you. This is just really exciting, really very exciting. So we're going to, again, a big applause to Meg for the work. And, and please offer your, your affirmative uh, feedback in the chat box. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our last presentation before we take a brief break. I'm going to introduce Becky Reitz, talk about a, a longer list that, which is on your than what's on the presentation schedule. But I'll start with EOPS Cares and CalWORKs and let her tell you about the others that she's going to tell you about. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Um, this is really exciting. And I'm really excited to hear about what everyone's had to say so far. This is a really unique thing that we're doing here. And I think it's uh, hopefully the first of many. Um, so I have three different areas that I'm going to focus on and a couple um, of additional ones as well. Um, but primarily, I'm going to focus on EOPS and care, uh, care and CalWORKs. So EOPS is the first one, and it's the original equity program in California Community Colleges. It was uh, founded in 1969, and so it's been around for, I guess, 52 years now. And our mission has always been to uh, provide over and above support services to students who are low income, first generation, students of color, undocumented immigrants, and or former foster youth, and, um, and to reach, help them reach their educational goals. Um, CARE is a sub-program of EOPS, and uh, the focus of CARE is to support single parents whose children are receiving cash aid from the county. So CARE students get all the same benefits that EOPS students do, uh, plus we provide them with additional services to make sure that they are making their educational goals, um, which will help them to become um, transition off of welfare and to secure the education, training, and skills needed for self-sufficiency. CalWORKs is a separate categorical program, but it lives coherently with EOPS and CARE. And um, the goal of CalWORKs is to support parents who are receiving cash aid from the county and to help them uh, become educated so they can permanently lift their families out of poverty through education. And we align with the educational master plan and strategic plan in many different ways. So I won't go through all these in great detail, um, but we do have um, orientation and they meet with our counselors. Um, they develop education plans. Those are really sort of the heart of what EOPS Care and CalWORKs are all about. Um, and of course, we, rely, we also align with the equity goals. So um, we do gather and analyze the data for our program routinely. And I'll share some of that information um, later as well. We, um, our staff and faculty participate regularly in equity focused professional development opportunities whenever we have the funding for it. And uh, we'd like to um, continue to work with our, our partners in the county as well as local nonprofits and um, our partners at the college that support similar populations. Um, this is something I wanted to share just because I'm a big part of what we're um, aligned with the college is also what we're aligned with at the state level, the chancellor's office. And so um, when the chancellor rolled out guided pathways a few years back, um, uh, a lot of my colleagues put together this flyer um, just to kind of show EOPS um, kind of believes the association kind of thinks that uh, guided pathways was based, basically based on EOPS. And so this flyer just sort of shows um, that we have been doing this work for a long time and that we are um, solidly aligned with everything that the Chancellor's Office is currently doing through their recent initiatives. So uh, students serve, we serve um, on average around 330 students each um, academic year. This is sort of an average over the last say five or six years that I put together. On average, we serve around uh, 25 CARE students and around 30 um, CalWORK students each semester. 
And as far as our staff, we have um, one full-time director, that's me. Uh, we have one full-time coordinator, that's Allison Martinez. A full-time specialist, that's Ugo Guillen. And we have two wonderful counselors, um, Javier Urena and Renetta Early. We also share, um, uh, we also have an uh, office on site for our Marin County CalWORKs counselor. So existing allocated resources, um, as required by law, my salary is 50% paid by the district. And uh, additionally, 15% of the coordinator salary is also district paid. Um, but all the other um, money that we spend in the programs is money that is uh, provided by the state through our categorical dollars. Um, so combined 17% of the total budgets for all three programs is district allocated funding. Um, and that is for us not really enough. Um, in the last five years, personal costs have increased um, by $133,554. So yes, I do track it to that level of detail um, because every dollar that we spend on personnel is less one dollar less that we can spend on our students. Um, our allocations from the state and the district have remained flat um, as has basically the number of students that we've served right up until now. This, this year we're seeing a, a decline in the number of students who are participating in our programs. This is actually happening across the state. Um, but um, before that, our, um, our numbers were the same. So with our increased personnel expenses and having to stay in the same number of students with the same amount of money, that has to give somewhere. And where that gives is that we're not unable to provide um, student book grants and services at the same level that we used to be able to. So for example, we used to do campus tours and we used to have speaker events and we used to provide food for our students and we used to be able to um, provide more supplies. Um, those things we're not, we're not able to do anymore. Um, so in order to restore those services to previous levels, um, we would need to have the, um, the district allocate permanent funding to offset those increased personnel costs um, and then agree to absorb any future increases in personnel costs. Otherwise, um, we're kind of on this, on this pathway towards uh, dwindling in terms of our, um, uh, our resources to the point where we'll just be basically paying for personnel and not be able to offer those over and above except for with that, what our creative staff can, can come up with um, that doesn't cost anything. Um, another thing that would be really, really helpful for us would be to have um, a comprehensive case management software program. Um, right now we've had to shift everything to online. We're required to keep significant records for EOPS, Care and CalWORKs. Um, we have files for each one of our students. And right now we're trying to do that all with Word documents and shared drives and all that kind of stuff. Um, it looks like it's, a, it's sort of the future of what I think we're going to be able to, to do for managing our programs. It would be really, really great to have a software program that we could use um, that would track that data um, and be able to um, have us keep our files in a really nice organized way that we can share. We are aligned with a lot of initiatives that you've already heard about today um, at College of Maroon, for example. Um, we used to live harmoniously with the Tutoring and Learning Center. That was really, really great for us. Our students felt like they had their very own home base on campus that had was full of other learners and had free printing and all of that. That was a, a relationship that was couple, uh, that was cultivated over probably, I would say, about 45 years in the making. Um, and then, so we're hoping in the new, new building that we'll be able to continue that relationship. And of course, we have uh, great relationships with our learning communities, um, Puente and Moja. Um, we work very closely with Summer Bridge. In fact, we actually bring our EOPS orientation to Summer Bridge um, just to make sure we capture those students. And then, of course, our Compass um, cohort, which we have our first one coming on, on board this year. Um, so we're really excited to be working with all those folks on campus. And we have a lot of county partners that we work with. You can see a list here of some of them. Um, we're always trying to expand this list. We love to be able to make a quick call over to Bloom and say, hey, I've got a family that really needs to have some clothing and be able to do a quick referral. Um, and so um, all, of these, all of these are sort of like those um, really essential things that we need for our students to even be able to go to school. So we work really hard to foster these relationships. And these are just some of our community partners. And then, of course, we're also connected on a statewide level um, with our CalWORKs um, Association, our EOPS Association, and I also serve as the Region 3 representative to the um, California Community Chancellor's Office um, for EOPS, which keeps us very connected to what's happening um, at the statewide level. 
So highlights and accomplishments. Um, I wanted to share some data from um, a report, a pre-report that we had done in 2019. And some of our outcomes were um, really, really great. We were happy to see this. We, we kind of intuitively knew this, but it's really always good to see the data. Um, so these are some of the things that our EOPS students did compared to a similar group. When we compared them, they carried a higher average term unit load. They earned more units on average. They have um, higher course retention rates, higher average success rates, higher average GPA. They achieved transfer prepared status at higher rates and were more likely to earn an AAAS or certificate. This is also very similar to what we see when we do um, statewide um, research projects with the RP group. A few years ago, we did one and um, very similar outcomes on a statewide level as well. So we know that EOPS is particularly effective for getting students to their goals. Um, I also wanted to just highlight uh, comparing EOPS students to all College of Marin transfer and degree seeking students, we see um, some other great things um, that they, they actually carry a higher, higher average term unit load, um, completed more units in a five year period. And uh, we love to see that our, um, the uh, graduation rate, 20% of EOPS students earned an AAAS in a five year period uh, compared to 15% of all College of Marin students. Um, so that's really kind of a, a great way of seeing that we're, we're getting them to their goal. And that's really what we're all about. Um, some other great things that we do in our program, we have a scholarship fund. And so every year uh, we provide around 15 scholarships or so to our students. We have um, a nice um, dinner out on the, on the performing arts patio. And uh, it's really a great evening to celebrate our graduates, our transfer students and our scholarship recipients. Last year and this year we'll be doing it online, of course. Um, and then the giving tree is really a big one. I included that little picture <laughs> that that mom sent to us because that little muffin was just so, so adorable. It was a little face. Five, five um, minutes. Thanks. Um, you guys did such a great job. So many of you are, who are here today um, supporting the giving tree. We've literally helped hundreds of low income children in our programs um, in the past several years, uh, including 96 that we were able to support in December last year. So the Giving Tree is something we're really proud of that we created and um, hope to continue that going into the future. And then something new that we did this year, which is really great that just kind of fell out of the sky is a, um, a program to um, get Thanksgiving dinner meals going for our students. So I spent like eight hours driving around the county delivering those. That was really fun. Um, and we're looking to expand that with our new um, partners this coming year. Um, we have um, been working really closely with student activities and um, been able to refer several of our um, students to Calm Care. It's been really great to work with them. They've received a lot of um, great support, laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, all that kind of thing. Um, and then of course, we've also re been referring them to our community resources, particularly during this difficult time. Um, and then I just also wanted to point out that a lot of our students um, in EOPS and CalWORKs have served on the ASCOM board as a student trustee, commencement speakers, and lots of other leadership roles as well. So our challenge is um, EOPS remains the greatest, largest equity program at College of Marin, but we lack the necessary resources to continue to carry out our mission. And CalWORKs is in a very similar situation. Um, it really, the thing about EOPS in particular is that how we attract our students is with our book grants. We say, hey, we're going to give you some money for your books, and that's what gets them in the door. And when they meet our counselors they, and they learn about the rest of the program, that's how we keep them. And right now, without a, a rigorous book grant program, um, we are having a hard time attracting new students. Um, and without being able to provide things that some of the other groups are providing, like campus tours and um, bringing on special events and providing food and all those kinds of things, um, we are unable to really provide the same kind of level of over and above services that we have been in the past. Um, so I, I think that um, at a lot of colleges, including our college, um, there's a need to ensure that we are all working synergistically to support our shared student population. Our EOPS students are also Amoja students, and they're also Summer Bridge students. And so um, I really want to make sure that there is a, um, not only an equitable, dis equitable distribution of resources, so that we're not competing for funding, but also that we're not duplicating services. I would love to see us all just continue to have these kinds of events. Um, where we have these conversations where we can work to become more synergistically um, working together to, to support our students 
um, and making sure that everyone's been taken care of, including our all of our programs. Um, so our future directions, we're looking to continue to maintain and develop strong partnerships with our campus colleagues, learning communities, and other equity-focused programs, um, including that are also our community partners. And um, we, we're real excited to be working with Compass to strengthen, strengthen, strengthen the pipeline of EOPS eligible students from the local high schools. We're going to be going in to meet some of our high school seniors who are going to be coming our way, so we're excited about that. Um, we're looking to really secure college and community funding so that we can support our scholarship program, um, but also, like I said, increase our book grants and reinstate some of our other student benefits. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking to purchase some software for student case management. Um, we're also looking to redesign the web pages for all of our programs um, as we become more and more um, sort of active and connected with our statewide partners. Um, we want to make sure that when they come into the College of Maroon um, EOPS Karen Cowork's websites that they are um, seeing a good visual representation of what we do, the kind of work that we do in our program. About, and one, we're minute. Well. About one minute. Okay, great. Um, we're looking to uh, develop an alumni database, and then we're also looking to add, or add a Next Up program. And Next Up is a program that comes also from the state, and that's going to support former foster youth. So that's going to be in the next couple of years. And then next month, actually, we're going to be um, piloting a program called Fresh Success, and that uh, supports CalFresh recipients with all kinds of additional services. Um, if they're taking CTE programs. So uh, again, lots of exciting things um, happening. And then of course, we're looking always to expand our support um, for our undocumented students. We're working actively on that right now. So again, there's lots of opportunity for collaboration. We want to make sure that we reestablish some of our relationships with Canal Alliance and other organizations that support undocumented students. Um, we're looking to create some new county partnerships and uh, maintain and collaborate with our um, EOPS and CalWORKs folks in Region 3. Um, we're super excited to continue in regular equity summits to ensure maximum impact and efficiency at the college. And of course, um, we're looking to strengthen our co collaboration with our learning communities and other groups so that we're working synergistically to support our shared student populations. So thanks folks, appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Becky. And, and we know there were some areas you didn't get to cover. And when we do this going forward, we may have additional presentations based on breaking out some of the programs, but uh, great work to you and your team. Clearly EOPS is a special place in many of our hearts. Uh, 50 plus years is California's longest uh, running equity program has done just has served millions of students. I may be exaggerating, but hundreds of thousands of students over the years. Um, so that brings us to our please applause for Becky and team. Uh, and I encourage you again to include your feedback in the, which you are, I see in the chat box. And this brings us to our first break and we're gonna take a 10 minute break and uh, then come back. I encourage you to go get some coffee, little snacks. Uh, we're also gonna be spotlighting our uh, graphic uh, recorder. So you can see some of the, the great work that she's been uh, catching based on all of the uh, great work that you're doing. So with that, I'm gonna call it, we're gonna come back at, um, uh, 10:18. See you then.
In case you can all hear me in the background, we're going to get started in about a minute. Okay, folks, it's 1018. We're going to come back together. Uh, I hope you enjoyed having the opportunity to see Karen Chan's work as it's a work in progress as she's visually recording our time together this morning. Uh, I just want to remind folks that the whole summit is being recorded uh, so that you, if you missed part of it or joining us uh, late, uh, you'll have the opportunity to go back and see the whole thing. In addition, just as a reminder that we will have all of this information will be recorded in a OneDrive document so that we can have a record of today's um, convening. So with that, we're gonna to move to our next presentation. And next up is Student Accessibility Services. And I'd like to ask uh, Stormy to uh, introduce her group and uh, to begin your presentation. Okay, good morning. It's good to be here with you all. Um, I am joined by Juliette Blank, uh, one of our counselors in Student Accessibility Services, and also El Demopoulos, our AT and Alt Media Specialist in Student Accessibility Services. And it's just been a pleasure to be here this morning to hear about the wonderful work that's being done while we have the opportunity to collaborate with so many of you during these times when we're at home and we're not seeing each other around campus, um, you feel a bit removed. And so to, to see the good work that's continuing even in this remote space is wonderful and it's just a pleasure to be here. Before we really dive into the presentation, I just wanted to provide some context. Um, I'm While I can't see everyone's face, I'm certain that just about everyone here, we have had the opportunity to work with closely, particularly thinking about the provision of access and accommodations for students with disabilities that we serve at COM. Um, but what I, I think oftentimes doesn't get seen, and if you've attended some of our more, more recent FLEX presentations, you've heard about the internal shift that Student Accessibility Services is having in terms of the way that we look at access and we think about that and re-envision our work. And moving from this model of uh, compliance and um, the legal components and rights to really looking at access, and you'll see this image here of access being love, it being uh, centered in our work from us taking an approach to disability justice, centering access, looking at it as you know, a critical component into the work that we do to amplify the voices of students with disabilities where we take a step back. We don't look at ourselves as disability experts, but we let the student take the lead and we really ensure that access is being provided from their lens. And we see that being much bigger than anything that student accessibility services can do on our own. It really is an institutional responsibility to be committed to this work and embrace it in a way where it becomes foundational to everything that you do um, from the start. So I lead with that, but I'll go ahead and let, uh, move into the next slide and let uh, Elle take the lead. Okay, well, here is a great description, working description on disability justice, right? To kind of signal, amplify what Stormy has been saying about our internal shift. This is really a framework that centers everyone's responsibility for looking at disability in a justice-minded framework. Next slide. And how does that relate to us in practical terms? Well, you know, looking at this compliance piece, well, the ADA law is a floor, it's not a ceiling, right? And often thinking about disability 
It centers around limitations and accommodating individuals in isolation. Now that could also mean isolation within a community or isolation within uh, services and provisions, right? So, you know, part of this work, we wanna highlight some of the collaborations that we have across campus that supports disability justice. One of the major efforts that SAS is a part of is DAW or the Digital Accessibility Workgroup. This is a work group that is supported by IT, SAS, DE, and college services, amongst many others. We provide increased captioning services. We look at addressing access at the procurement level. And we also work to centralize information and provide those resources when folks need it. Uh, in particular case, I want to give some kudos to Stacy Lentz, who supports SAS in making online learning content accessible amongst all of her other duties. And I also want to point out and uh, give some kudos to my colleague, Sarah, Susan Robin, who works on OER and CTC that obviously supports open educational resources through the Zero Textbook Cost Initiative, uh, focusing on access, accessibility, and economic justice. Uh, in fact, we just got a consortium grant that uh, we are working on with other uh, community colleges throughout California. So hit us up if you want to know more about that. Next slide. So another framework that we base our work on is um, doing our work through an access-centered mindset. And what that really means is radically centering intersectional access. So I'll just read this here. We think of access not only in regard to disability, but all of our identities, race, class, gender, sexuality, size, language, immigration status, and more. We believe that offering this kind of space, language, and culture gets us closer to access that is rooted in love, connection, and liberation of all beings. Next slide. So how we have been putting this framework into practice. So number one, we've been offering more consultation with faculty. Um, and our goal here is really empowering faculty in what being access-centered really means, and then you know, discussing ways to apply that in the classroom where eventually they can feel more empowered in that they're doing that on a regular basis. Um, also, we've created some SAS specific spaces for the students that work with us and use our services. Um, some of these has been, we have a class right now exclusive to students within SAS. Uh, we have another program that's exclusive for students who are on the autism spectrum. Um, and we have a monthly SAS support group for any students that work with us in our services. Um, some of the goals for these groups and these programs is really to center on the individual student needs and really see what these students specific needs are, especially right now through the pandemic and through the shift to online learning and us catering to this a little bit more in this curriculum that we're building and the groups that we're working with them in will help them hopefully eventually in their other classes and make a trans an easier transition in their other classes and programs throughout, um, throughout COM. Also, we've been collaborating with different groups and programs on campus. As Elle was mentioning, some of those partnerships and collaborations. We also work with ComCare. We have some community groups that we work with. And the reason for this is we really see access outside of just accommodation support. We really want to work with other groups on campus to really address the many needs that our students hold and the many experience that they have with their varying identities. So we can't just rely on accommodations as access. We really have to see uh, what else they're needing to fill in all those gaps. And lastly, I'll just read this last bullet, encouraging others on campus to think of access not only as an act of compliance, what Stormy and Elle have already mentioned, but also as a form of compassion, love, and empathy, understanding that access needs are something to pay attention to for all students, not just those with disabilities and those with accommodations, especially in this new climate of learning. So I'll just say with that, that with this pandemic and with the shift to online learning, 
a lot more access needs have come up and it's not just been for the students with disabilities. It's been overall with the whole student body where we have to be aware of that, that there's been uh, more access needs overall and new access needs that we've had to put our minds around and come up with some solutions. Um, and we're doing that not just out of obligation of law um, or compliance, we're doing that out of really empathizing with the student experience. Next slide. Speaking of intersectionality, I think this really ties into our work for access and disability justice by looking at all of the ways our identities and those identities have social barriers, you know, how they impact our student population, as well as the entire campus community. Here's a great working definition here. I'll let you pause and read it over for just one second. But I really like this idea of identities are like traffic flowing at an intersection. One identity may flow in one direction while another identity is flowing in a different direction. Next slide. Another way or another perspective you might take on intersectionality is that ability and access barriers, they can take many forms and are often compounded by these intersectional identities. This can impact any member of our college community, right? So we're thinking about not just having incidental or environmental barriers like, you know, a broken arm or a lack of sleep or stay at home orders or power outages but there's also that social and systemic, right? So thinking about oppression or bias by institutional systems, uh, language, culture, and communication differences, or just time and resources. You know, we are impacted and we have limited access and, and have barriers to accessing computers or Wi-Fi hotspots, or we have food and housing insecurity or we have conflicting work, family, and or childcare schedules, right? So SAS in our work, we recognize these impacts and work with SAA and the larger campus community to address students in our community in a more holistic access-centered way, including supporting basic needs distribution, working with our learning communities, and engaging with our community partners with outreach. In particular, um, we have a few of our partners here, MCOE, uh, Department of Rehab, Star Academy, Autistry. I know I teach a tech workshop uh, for STAR students to, to support their onboarding to the college community and Part of our needs, we hope to increase those types of supports and offer more of them in the future. And this last definition, so ableism, I think the, the best way to really explain ableism is that when there are constructs that just tell us this is the way it is and how it has to be, um, we have to look at that and see that's only one experience, that's one perspective and does not necessarily include all experiences and needs. So one example of this is college learning in the United States before the pandemic, there was this one dominant way of bringing this learning experience to students. You know, and then once the pandemic hit, we didn't have this ability to go back to that anymore none of us had that ability anymore where we had to shift and we had to change and there had to be creative flexibility around that. So in thinking about that, I just hope going forward that we could keep that mindset that there isn't one way to teach, there isn't one way to learn, and there is room uh, to change the experience and be flexible around it depending on the varying experience and needs of our students. So we just want to take a quick moment to share how we believe our work connects with the educational master plan and strategic plan. 
So we think about how we've shifted our hours to extend into the evening, at least on Wednesdays, and are thinking more about how can we increase our hours into the evening, which ties into <clears throat> the student access and success goal. Um, we also think about our collaboration and partnership with community-based organizations and are really excited about our uh, work that's coming up uh, in partnership with some of these organizations to launch a Marin County transition series, think specifically working towards providing opportunities for students with disabilities in K through 12, um, transitioning out of the school system into um, post-secondary services and, and education as well. Um, we've and, and that lines with student access and success goal five. And then we think about our the recent flex opportunities. And even today, when we're talking about disability justice, access center, pedagogy and support services. I won't spend too much time on this slide, but it gives you a, a sense of who are the folks in student accessibility services, adapted PE and psych services is listed here, which we'll um, hear from later. Um, but one of the critical points that I wanna make, and Becky spoke to this as well, is we typically serve 728, 750 students in an academic year. It's interesting to see that historically in fall, at least for the past several years, we've served about 500 or so student, 525 students on average. Um, in fall of 20, we served 404. That's about 23, 25% less students. And we're seeing that system-wide, statewide. Minute. One minute. So, okay, great. Um, so with that, I just wanna, make note of you know our recognition that we're not serving the same number of students students are choosing to not pursue education particularly students with disabilities or they're not connecting with us for services and so that's an area of concern i won't go into the resources allocated but know that we're categorically funded and also rely on district support and with our time remaining I don't know that I can take a deep dive into opportunities and challenges, um, but I think we've alluded to it a lot in terms of um, our need to shift from a, a compliance and rights model to an access-centered approach, approach in, institution-wide, which would call on all of you as serving as partners in, in this collaborative effort. Time goes by so quickly. I'm it so does sorry. indeed. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Such important information. Uh, thank yeah, you very much. And, and the great news is to everybody is it's, this information will be housed in the OneDrive document. So if you weren't able to see it, you'll be able to go back and access it moving forward. Uh, terrific presentation and such an important, an important reminder that disability and accessibility justice are essential elements to, to, to equity. So we can't possibly have this conversation today without this important in inclusion. So Stormy, thank you to you and your team. Okay, our next presenters, hang on here, I'm having timer difficulties. Okay, our next presenters, Human Resources, uh, Nikki Harris. And again, please add your kudos and applause to uh, Student Accessibility Services out in the, in the chat box. Can everyone see my screen? I'm doing a double screen here, so I just wanna make sure. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Nikki Harris. I'm the Director of Human Resources. Um, let me just move this here. There we go. Director of Human Resources. And um, first, I want to thank you all for being here today. And um, we hope you are well and safe. Um, you're healthy and so forth. So the Human Resources um, Equity Initiative, um, we strive to consistently attract, uh, retain, train, and develop a skilled and equity-minded diverse workforce in support of the College of Marin mission. Um, as the Equal Opportunity Officer, the Title IX Coordinator, and a responsible officer under Title Five, um, my role um, is connected to the EEO Advisory Committee, the President Superintendent's Office, and the College Mission. Um, as far as the Equal Opportunity um, Council, um, I analyze, I advises the Council and analyzes recruitment data um, for adverse impact, 
collaborate with the com committee and to update and maintain the district EEO plan, um, prepare re related EEO reports, oversee unlawful discrimination complaints, and provide training and related cultural competency and inclusiveness to associated topics. The alignment with the educational master plan, um, this will be more going more detailed during the EEO um, portion of the presentation that's in later this afternoon. But really it's in our, our, our initiatives are embedded into the educational master plan and strategic plan. And these are the highlights of that. Um, I serve as the champion for the um, EPM2 um, and as well as connecting those initiatives to the vision of success in reducing equity um, gaps across various measures through fast improvement um, amongst traditionally unrepresented groups with the goal of cutting the achievement gap by 40%. Um, within the next five years and fully closing the gap within the next 10 years. That is once again, the vision of success um, goes outlined by the chancellor's office. So right now, this is the, um, the number of students and employees that we serve. Um, of course, this is the HR team um, that back me when I'm supporting and, and doing the work. But also I work with a various number of um, departments on specific projects and deadlines. Um, and the name of the EEO Council, um, the Executive Management Team, the Office of the President, Superintendent, the Academic Senate President, um, Students Activities and Advocacy Office, Student Accessibility Service Office, and various departments depending on the need. Um, existing resources allocated um, and additional resources needed. So right now we have the human resource staff that support a lot of the work we've been doing, um, particularly um, attending many job fairs, um, which we have had the, priv the privilege of um, obtaining marketing swag to really represent our college and, and get a lot of um, attraction to our tables when we're out recruiting um, of course, we have the HR budget um, and the EEO funds that support some of our recruitment and retention efforts. Um, we've been able to capitalize on that the last few years um, based on our submission of the nine multiple methods um, and actually having an active EEO plan in place. Um, the additional resources needed, you know, time and dedication, um, dedicated staff that solely focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, um, given most of the current um, climate within this country is moving to this, this DEI work. So everything is centered on that. Um, this is the future of work. So having a dedicated staff to that will be a great opportunity for us. Um, you know, of course, more training will always, it's something that I always advocate for, um, human resources. <laughs> um, the biggest one I think is, you know, funding to support the Title IX regulations in the ADA accommodations, similar to what um, Stormy team just, just presented, given we're just, the way we're conducting work these days are in more of a hybrid model. So we want to be able to support not only accommodations physically, but also remotely. Um, and, and that does require funding and support. And then, of course, always more additional funding to support the EEO initiatives. I think, you know, having more sponsoring events like this will be a great opportunity to not only retain, but also to re attract employees, potential employees. So alignment with other initiatives, um, the HR department alignment is embedded in our mission. Um, the mission drives all of the calm initiatives and programs. Um, and I think one of the things important to remember is, you know, in everything we do, it is the mission that's driving it from the educational master plan to the strategic plan to the program and services we provide students. Um, 
and the community. So I really, I highlighted a few things in, the, in our mission because that is what's driving all of those plans and initiatives. Some highlighting accomplishments. Um, I, you know, there's quite a bit since I've been on board here at the College of Marin. I think um, one of the most, um, one of the biggest highlights I see is just having structure in our recruitment process. Um, and I'm gonna throw a little plug here if anyone have an opportunity to, to read over the accreditation um, uh, uh, interim report, I would definitely, midterm report, I definitely recommend it. It's very detailed in what we've been doing here. Um, but a big highlight, and this is connected to the strategic plan. We, you know, we review all job postings, screening criteria, interview questions to ensure the content is equity minded. Anyone that's serving on the committee is probably familiar with that or and also attended um, training um, with myself and general counsel, Amia Robert Shaw, to really ensure that we are providing the training required to actually serve in a capacity of this, as a screening committee member. Um, teaching demonstrations is a big part of our faculty recruitments. And, and so far it's been a, a, a very good success, if you ask me, I think, it really brings um, every, us connected to the student side of the house, as well as ensuring that uh, we're meeting the needs of, of, the, of our departments and of course, our students. Um, we updated our evaluation tools um, to ensure that content was equity minded. Um, also, we're, we've updated administrative um, uh, procedure 7120, which is required in the EEO plan. In addition to, in the last three years, we've um, pretty much trained about 280 employees um, in unconscious bias um, in EEO screening committee 101. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, I can go on and on, but I think some of the things to highlight that it's, that's on the other side of the house that just in, in some HR initiatives in, in my department and area. Um, we've updated the student, um, the student and non-students um, salary schedule to, to pay minimum wage at $15 an hour uh, to at least have that where that's equitable given the cost of living in the county and so forth. Um, we've developed a EEO opportunity non-discrimination webpage. Um, we've updated our hiring procedures um, related to criminal background checks to come to align with the Chancellor's Office recommendations. And of course, we implemented um, Senate Bill 1343, Sexual Harassment Prevention um, for all employees, which all of our employees have been trained in as of today. A few more comments to add, and you know, just basic job announcements include student demographic data, racial data, um, along with um, uh, diversity statements, um, application requirements include description of app applicants ability to describe their experience studies or work that have influenced um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, removing barriers such as the foreign degree um, holder process, we updated that with working with the Academic Senate to take to make sure that we're not creating barriers. Um, closed capturing it's a big, closed captioning is a big um, initiative today as we are in a remote learning environment. So we want to make sure all employees um, have that access as Stormy was mentioning. Um, it's not, a, not necessarily about a compliance, it's about access. Um, and of course the job fairs are a big thing for us. We're able to, to actually get exposure that way. And we receive a lot of feedback from um, potential candidates um, and the questions they have about our college um, and what we're doing here. So the greatest challenge, um, I'm, I'm sure most of you are not aware, but the, the last administration, um, presidential administration um, passed the new federal standards for Title IX. It's um, handling uh, campus sexual assaults and harassment um, that is probably our greatest challenge, um, being in a remote setting, in addition to the regs that are very um, time consuming and costly, but um, we, we definitely know that's gonna be a challenge, but we would definitely make it happen. 
Of course, the cost of living, everyone knows that in Marin County. Um, allocating more time for job fairs, outreach in the pipeline, we're in this virtual climate, so how do we still attract um, potential applicants um, in addition to attracting the diverse applicants? Um, I think what stands out for me, um, just the uncertainty of the new normal work workforce and anticipating those needs while we do the equity work, that is what, what does that look like? It's changing daily. Um, so trying to keep a brace to that. Um, and then of course, compliance overload. Um, and I say compliance overload because there's regulations coming from federal, state and local regarding the workforce. So we have to be able to uh, adjust rapidly to those uh, demands and requirements. Um, and, and that definitely is going to be a challenge. But the future is looking bright. I think prioritizing the DEI initiatives is something we're doing. And I think that is a great marketing tool for our, our um, institution. Virtual job fairs allows for expansion of applicant pools, the hybrid work model, you know, modifying our marketing, um, a, a modern benefits plan to attract more candidates. And, um, you know, just, you know, being ready for the new workforce and, and, and what that looks like in the demands of it. And then the opportunities for collaboration, um, you know, creating a website um, to showcase the College of Marin equity work. As I mentioned, you know, when you attend in job fairs, they want to know what we're doing. They're actually interviewing me. Um, so they want to know what we are doing. Um, so being able to go through that, um, have some access or resource to show them what all of you guys are doing, it, it's a great uh, marketing tool. Um, you know, continuing to update our board policies and procedures through the DEI lens, um, that is essential moving forward. And we've been able to institute that throughout um, some of the updated recent board policies and procedures. More, more, more equity summits. Um, and, and this is an essential for me because every year I'm required to report to the Chancellor's Office what our EEO efforts, equity efforts are. And a lot of time I scramble trying to find out what people are doing and I reach out to our VPs and say, hey, is anybody doing some work in your area? So just being able to be present today and hear the work we're doing, it's a great opportunity and selling point for us. Um, uh, one minute. Okay. Leveraging technology. Um, of course, HR will be leaning on technology um, for more automated processes just to be able to allocate the time for the DE work, I mean, DEI work. So it's like understanding what are, what, what can we um, focus our energy in, in, in um, areas of concerns at. Um, and also I think the biggest one that I think I'm excited about, which I've been asking for for years, um, it is the kind of chancellor's office. I, I feel they're um, more engaged with the college and the work given some of the mandates that's come down, but I do believe they're more engaged and being able to provide us with resources to really implement some of the, those um, policies and procedures that's coming through their office. And then of course they're creating best practices, which is great. It's a great tool for us to kind of guide to ensure we're in line um, with what they're expecting from us, especially when we have to submit reports and so forth. Um, I'm it's that time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Again, time goes by so quickly. I want to thank Nikki for her great presentation. I, I want to say that we're so fortunate to to be working with this human this group of this team of human resources professional professionals under Nikki's leadership. In my ten years, it's never been stronger. So I really appreciate the work that they're doing. So let's give them a round of applause. Lots of kudos in the in the chat box, which you have. Uh, thanks so much, Nikki. Okay. Uh, in putting this together, you know, I, I, I realized we have more acronyms than I think any other organization we must, right? And I think GRIT probably can't be, we're probably the only group that has a GRIT, right? So in the, in the initial invitation, I made sure that I spelt out what every group was so we understood what their acronyms were. But with that lead in, let me hand it off to our next group, which is GRIT and Guided Pathways. And I'll let Tanya remind us what GRIT is, but uh, Tanya Hirsch. Hello, everyone. So um, let's see if I can share my screen.
All right. Um, so yes, I'm talking about GRIT and GRIT does stand for Guidance, Resources, Integration and Transformation Committee. Um, and yes, that is a lot to remember. Um, but it is very important work. And so recently, um, GRIT has the GRIT committee has uh, spent a lot of time revising our mission to make it more equity focused and to focus on um, anti racist, um, you know, work to and also um, initiatives in terms of anti blackness. So um, I'm showing you our, our mission here. Um, and all of the underlying parts are the areas that we have revised. Um, particularly to review and assess the integration of internal and external researching, uh, research and promising practice, anti-racist and equity practices across programs with regard to student access, retention, success, and completion. So that's really a lot of the work that we've been doing lately. Um, sorry, let me go to my next. Um, the accomplishments for GRIT is the student equity plan, the development and accountability of that program. We've had many facilitated discussions with uh, several departments and programs across the campus to talk about that work and to make sure that it is happening. We're actually bringing those people in um, to talk about what has been done, what's the progress, and how that's going to continue forward. GRIT also worked on the non-instructional program review template, creating instru in, uh, institutional outcomes and guiding questions that are grounded in equity and anti-racism. And um, we can pass those on, but the idea really is to um, create a, a template that all program review can do that is um, focused on equity and anti-racism. We've collaborated with many groups um, across the campus. And so I, I give you a little sampling of some of those people. I have a lot to get through, so I'm trying to go quickly. Um, in terms of the student equity plan, there's a lot of alignment with strategic plan. We were very careful to make sure that there is that alignment. Um, within the document that we created, um, the supplemental document, we actually put in the action steps within the student equity plan that aligns with the strategic plan and the educational master plan. I just wanted to kind of show you here how much overlap there is um, with those. Um, other the other plan. The student equity plan, um, particularly around equity, I wanted to focus um, on these in particular is focus equity flex activities on effective pedagogy and classroom management. So really looking at teaching strategies and what's happening in the classroom. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to mention is that recently our student equity plan was um, looked at through the chancellor's office in terms of equity language, and its focus. And one of the things that we did really well on was um, our student activities and our student services. But one of the areas that we did get some feedback is looking at equity in our classrooms and focusing on that. And so that's really where we're taking it um, to the next step. And so we want to um, continue to support non-instructional program review process. Um, we will also provide uh, review academic and non-instructional program review for patterns. That's one of the things that GRIT does in particular is looking for patterns across the campus um, through those program reviews. Um, continue to assess the progress of the student equity plan and really taking the feedback from the chancellor's office and integrating in um, the, that feedback into our plan, our current plan, and also looking forward um, into the next student equity plan. And of course, we want to continue to work with um, instructional departments, new work with the Moja Equity Institute, professional learning committee towards greater equity in the classroom, looking in that work ahead. So guided pathways for success. And I will, um, I also have Gina Cullen here and Kristen Perone who will be helping me uh, with this as well. Um, and Guided Pathways includes Humanities 101, Counseling 130, the MAPS Learning Community, uh, Student Voice and Involvement um, Initiative, Guided Pathways Navigation, also the Guided Pathways Scale of Adoption Self-Assessment, and um, our California Guided Pathways cohort that we're a part of. So HUM 101, um, a lot of you have heard about HUM 101. And this is one of our foundational courses for guided pathways. And I think one of the most important things to know about um, HUM 101 is that all of the classes, regardless of the theme, are all grounded in social justice. And so that's really one of the important aspects of HUM 101. The other aspect is that skill building, that career and discipline exploration. And it really is 
um, sort of a, a introduction into academic discourse. And the other nice thing about HUM 101 is that it crosses several of the, um, across the campus because you have an English skills instructor who is providing that content, I mean, the, um, the content and the skill building. And then you have a counselor, you have embedded tutors and mentors in there, as well as content teachers across disciplines. And so it really is a collaborative effort. Um, we've also shown that there's proven support for the lowest GPA group of students. So students that fall um, at 2.7 high school GPA or lower definitely benefited from taking HUM 101 in terms of their ability to succeed later on. And so we're seeing success already, um, particularly with our students of color as well. Um, Counseling 130 is also another foundational course for guided pathways. And um, again, we what we do is we encourage students to take HUM 101 along with the Counseling 130. And that again, that Counseling 130 is about career and life skills planning. And, um, and so really kind of making that connection and then also connecting them with, um, with the learning communities, MAPS, Emoja, and Puente. So the idea is really trying to create um, you know, sequential support for students through HUM 101, through Counseling 130, and then the learning community. So really those wraparound services for students. And again, you can see alignment with our SAS goals for the educational master plan in terms of reducing barriers and effective orientation. Um, because you have counseling um, counselors teaching this course, you have that orientation throughout a whole semester as opposed to just um, you know, one small orientation at the beginning. We have that throughout the semester so that students can get that support um, continually. And MAPS, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen Perone to talk about um, MAPS. Kristen? I'm here, I'm not sure how to... There you go. You're oh, Okay. Um, thanks for uh, let, uh, being here. I think this is a great event so far. I just want to briefly touch on the MAPS learning community. As you heard from Tanya about the HUM 101 and Counseling 130, those two courses are included in the MAPS learning community. Our target is first-time students. Um, we want them to take the HUM 101 and Counseling 130 in their first semester, and a large component of the program is our peer mentoring program. We have 10 peer mentors that we've hired. Um, they are both work-study students and hourly students, which enables us to hire both uh, DACA students and international students. So we have a very diverse um, peer mentoring team. Um, they each have roughly between eight and 10 mentees that they work with individually. They meet with them individually and in groups. Um, we organize activities that include social events and a speaker series. Um, they are developed and coordinated by the mentors. So they often come up with their own ideas. Some of the activities that we've done in the past include um, a self-love um, event during Valentine's Day. And then we have some more academic related speaker series. We've um, hosted a financial aid workshop or resume building workshop. Um, and we also in usual times have a physical space on campus that uh, allows students a safe and inclusive space to be able to come and hang out. Um, we realized as we, a few years ago, as we were moving forward with our program, there wasn't, um, a space like that on campus that uh, was intentional in its inclusivity and the safety in the actual physical location. Um, students are able to come and hang out, get snacks, free printing. There is always at least two mentors kind of manning the area, um, welcoming students in. It has been a wonderful recruitment opportunity for us because students are able to bring their friends in and that's how we've grown the program in the past. Um, as we've pivoted to the virtual environment, it's been challenging um, to recruit mentees. So something that we've done this year, um, actually starting last semester, was to have um, each mentor connected with a HUM 101 and a Counseling 130 section. So every class has what we're calling a class facilitator 
um, in the class and this is giving our mentors direct access to students and they're able to meet with the instructors regularly and help students navigate the class and Canvas and Zoom and all of the things that go along with the virtual environment. Um, they also have access to uh, us as counselors and additional resources on campus. Five, and with five that, minutes. I'll, I'll hand it back over to Tanya. Thank you, Kristen. Um, we also have um, part of Guided Pathways for Success is student in voice and involvement. So it's a, we are, um, Eric Munoz is helping with that to really um, use focus groups and surveys for their interest clusters and websites um, that we've been doing in terms of our Guided Pathways work. Um, we also, he's been using HUM 101, Counseling 130 and Compass students for some of that. And we're also looking at other ways to uh, look at to get feedback from students across the campus. So that's one of our goals. And you can um, see that it matches with gather and incorporate student voice as equity uh, scorecard process. And then um, we have collaboration across many different groups. And then here is our guided pathways navigation and scale of adoption self assessment. So Gina Colon who is our Guided Pathways Coordinator. She um, and many people, um, design services and um, IT have worked really hard to create our new interest clusters webpage and um, along with uh, career exploration links and discipline mapping. Um, and so one of the exciting things about this is having students engage and enter in terms of what they're interested in and looking at different disciplines in that regard. Um, and again, that's about reducing access and barriers and it is a part of the Guided Pathways model. Um, we also are part of the Guided Pathways California Cohort 2. Um, this is our team. Uh, Dr. Kuhn is part of it, Julian Solis, Nigel Hakens, um, Apa, Alex, Alexander Jones, Eric Munez, um, Gina and myself. We also have uh, Jonathan and Carrie who are alternates and we will be reaching out to people to see um, if people want to attend certain seminars and webinars that they offer. Uh, these are all virtual at this point. Um, but the idea behind this is really getting feedback from other campuses and engaging in that collaboration. Um, to get feedback and help and kind of work together on some of these issues. Um, guided pathways, we have been getting, um, this has been categorical funds and those funds do go away at the end of um, 21, 22. So eventually the district will need to help um, to take on those programs um, at an institutional level. So at this point, all of these programs have been run through that guided, those guided pathways categorical funds. And so our accomplishments have been, um, you know, the uh, ground, uh, sorry, foundational courses and the sequential support strategy. So really looking at supporting students from the beginning, looking at Compass, Summer Bridge, and then getting in them into HUM 101, Counseling 130, the learning communities, and again, providing that sequential support across. Um, we've streamlined non-credit ESL enrollment processes, the new cluster, um, interest clusters, math and English placement process, and, um, and we continue to work on that. Of course, one of the challenges is always uh, capacity and people power. Um, so the work ahead is just refining that uh, HUM 101 and the placement process. Um, we have a lot of work to do with uh, still AB 705 in regard to a, um, ESL, working with our academic departments on the roadmaps, our master schedule, uh, including labor market and really engaging all students to provide feedback on institutional efforts. And um, sorry, everyone, that was sort of was trying to scrunch a lot of stuff in um, that we've been doing all those different groups. So thank you everyone who participates in this. These initiatives are really across the campus and um, there's a lot of hard work going on. So, and it's nice to hear everyone in terms of what everyone is doing, so thank you. Thank you, Tanya, and uh, the GRIT and Guided Pathways team. I, just yet another excellent example of how we are improving outcomes for students and really truly moving the equity needle. Just, it's, it's amazing. And I have to say that hearing about these programs this morning again, of course, is uh, I just miss being able to see and interact with all those students in these programs. So again, so let's give kudos to uh, Tanya, GRIT team, Pet Guided Pathways, uh, and I encourage you, to, as you have been, to give them some feedback in the chat as well. So with that, we're going to uh, move to our idea committee, and we have uh, T. Perales. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I just first want to invite us just to take well, invite you to take a collective breath. This is extraordinary work that's happening here at College of the Marin. So I just wanted to take a moment for us to just take it in and then just take that breath um, of just, you know, and we're also like pushing through time right now and constraints. So just to take that moment to just sit with this and acknowledge this extraordinary work happening here. So thank you, Dr. Kuhn, for, um, for organizing this today. Um, and this has just been super inspiring and super informative. So just wanna acknowledge that and thank you all again today. My name is T. I am, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and they, them, and theirs. I am the Equity and Activities Coordinator for the Office of Student Activities and Advocacy, and I'm also the chair of the IDEA Committee, which is one of the love of my life, loves of my life, so I'm excited to talk about that with you all today. So this is our extraordinary team right now. We have, are made up of students, staff, and faculty. Um, it has been an honor and a privilege to work with this team and um, just want to give a special shout out to just these extraordinary folks here on in the idea committee shout out to the folks who are in the house and i first just really want to emphasize um, the theories and the practices that the idea committee is is really rooted in one of that being um, to really um, acknowledge and address and dismantle white supremacy um, and racism. And this example, I think sometimes when we think of white supremacy, we might think that that might look a certain way, but it really can even happen in um, ways that aren't as overt. And so this really shows some of the ways that that shows up and that we really are acknowledging that, um, that white supremacy is the foundation of this country and it shows up institutionally, including um, at college campuses and at College of Marin. And so we really takes um, intentionality and we really are wanting to focus and acknowledge and name these things. And then also this green slide is something if folks who've come to our community and practice, which I'll be talking about in a moment, another theory and practice that we have really tried to embody and spread to our campus is this idea of really confronting racism um, and recognizing our that us really being proactive and anti-racism really depends on the practice of conflict skills and of healing our, race, our traumas related to racism um, and maybe some of our own fears and insecurities that might stand in the way of us moving from um, equity mindedness to equity in practice that comes from moving from just not being racist to actually being anti-racist. And when we talk about conflict skills, it means that we are really leaning into the discomfort that we might feel about talking about these really important topics, um, that we show up to these spaces and conversations with, with curiosity, with honesty, with patience with ourselves and one another, and that we really are here to work towards individual transformation and growth and collective transformation and growth. And that um, you know, these are really important conversations to have and really acknowledging that we're coming at it from different places and our different parts um, are at different places in our journey with this and how do we really work together collectively and really bring that to practice here at COM. And so, as I mentioned, this really takes, when we talk about anti-racism, equity, accessibility, all these really important um, topics and areas of action, it really requires intentionality paying attention and focusing on what it is that we are aiming to do. And I really think that this Angela Davis quote speaks volumes and is something that holds me accountable to this work is that diversity doesn't mean anything if the institution stays the same. So we can have diverse spaces or strive to have a more um, diverse campus and community, but really it's, that really can really, it doesn't mean much if we're not changing the institutional barriers, the ways that um, racism and white supremacy show up in our institutions. So some of the ways that we're doing that and focusing on that with IDEA is we are reviewing and editing our charge right now. And we are really paying attention to, are we in alignment with um, national, with the community, California community colleges, with our equity plan um, in, 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 and with our nine point anti-racist plan, which I will share with you in a moment. Also, we serve as the advising and consulting committee for the, our president around equity and anti-racist initiatives. So um, idea, we meet with Dr. Kuhn regularly to give recommendations around messaging, around support, around resources, and to really approach this collaboratively. 
Also, we aim to be a convening point of social justice and anti-racism and equity at the College of Marin. And also we generate materials and education opportunities for social justice, equity, and anti-racist learning. Emails that you all receive about opportunities to continue our development around this. Um, flex pr professional learning, all these things that like we really are wanting to generate this and to really hope to infuse this throughout the entire campus. And really, again, shifting from making sure that we're moving from equity minded to also equity practices. So it's really focusing on the action um, and how are we measuring that success. So this summer, um, as we know, um, there was an increase of, I'd say, more visibility, mainstream visibility. So this has been happening for a very long time around um, anti blackness, around racism, and how white supremacy shows up with the um, murders and brutality against um, our beloved Black community. And so um, Chancellor Oakley came out with a call to action in response to that. And so us as the IDEA Committee and EEO, our Equal Employment Opportunity Crew, we met and we came up with a nine-point equity and anti-racist plan. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to this, I know this was distributed to campus, but really wanted to revisit that to show that these are some of the areas that we really want to see us focus on um, and to really strive to, to meet these um, recommendations, um, including, again, just acknowledging how white supremacy and racism shows up um, institutionally and also individually and in our communities, and then how do we really pay attention and focus on the transformation and the growth of moving into anti-racist equity practices. And also what's the accountability plan um, to, to, for us to measure that we're being successful at this. Some of the highlights of the IDEA committee that I just wanted to, to share with you all is, is um, our community in practice. So again, in response this summer, um, as we came up with the nine point anti-racist plan, we also really wanted to come together as a community here at faculty and staff at College of Marin to really reflect on race, to talk about it, and to really engage on anti-racism, and to really build community of support and trust, and to really put to practice this idea of conflict skills. How do we come together and talk about this and normalize talking about this? Um, this might feel uncomfortable to some folks, and yet it's really important to have. So how are we building um, relationships of trust so we can have these conversations. So this also is the flyer that of the dates that are um, so Wednesday, February 24th next week is going to be um, our next community in practice. And this really is just a monthly ongoing series to really engage in um, reflection, dialogue and practice and that we really are aiming to cultivate a brave space that really is centering black healing um, and solidarity with with black, our black community and really focusing on anti-racist practices as well as healing. And the way that we set this up is by having affinity spaces to really have intentional spaces based on our racial identity so that we can be in community to, to support one another and also share what our experiences are um, and to really do that in a way that um, is as most effective as possible. And these have been some really sacred and powerful spaces that I'm just really, really proud of the folks that have attended and are cultivating the space um, because the participants really are what is helping us cultivate this together. Um, and then also there's this photo of Cesar Cruz. So the during our um, convocation keynote speakers have been um, really rooted in equity and anti-racist practices. And the idea has been a part of making those recommendations of researching who do we wanna to bring to the College of Marin. And it's just been really inspiring to see um, you know, folks who are doing great work and to see um, presenters of color coming in and also sharing their knowledge and wisdom. And then also the IDEA EEO anti-racist nine point plan, just really proud of that collaboration and of seeing how that is um, starting to come to play and, and is in movement here at College of Marin. And then this month, um, you may have attended our town hall conversation with Dr. Kuhn on race. And um, I just thought that was a really great opportunity to center this conversation and to, um, to have a conversation about race and to really use our town hall space to center this conversation. So really um, proud and thankful for that. And so when trying to calculate our number of students and employees served, though we have numbers on here, so we had our first, we had a in 2019 of the fall, 
We had a faculty and staff mixer for uh, faculty and staff of color to come together, talk about our experiences at College of Marin or in our communities. Um, so we have some numbers for that. Um, and then our convocation equity keynote speakers, which is for our, all faculty and staff. We were really um, happy to see that our presence town hall, our conversation on race had about 374 faculty, staff and some students. Uh, our community and practice, our very first community practice over the summer, we had approximately 35 faculty and staff. Um, and then monthly, we're averaging about 18 to 25 overall among all the affinity spaces. And then our flex, um, our spring flex session, that was community and practice, we had 47 participants and really engaged in really powerful discussion and community building. So we're really right. looking forward to seeing how that carries into this semester. Yeah, five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. We also have our flex sessions and programs, including um, cultivating safer virtual classrooms, LGB LGBTQ plus brave spaces, and all of the equity sessions that are happening, um, a lot that are produced from the flex, I mean, from the IDEA committee. And so even though we have some numbers for some of the programs and the and that we've, we've served, really, when I think about this, it's as that this is an ongoing movement. So if we're having, faculty and staff mixers, and we're having the community and practice town halls, and we're having flex sessions. This is a ripple effect that really does, it'll impact the experiences as faculty, as staff, um, and also this impacts our students, right? So if we, um, in our roles as faculty and staff, are really doing um, our anti-racist and equity learning and transformation and practice, and really, you know, really holding that center, that is going to impact students. So though we have these numbers on the screen, this is impacting in a deeper level and even in a really expansive way that can't even be measured in these numbers right now. And I'm, and even just hearing everything that's happening here at the College of Marin in all these different offices and departments in ways that this, I just want to acknowledge that this is beyond what numbers could even measure, that this is really changing the experiences um, of our students and even as our colleagues. So want to make sure that we acknowledge that and really if we are you know in in alignment of our equity plan our strategic plan our nine point plan that really idea is in alignment um, with all of our programs on our campus and we really want to deepen that um, and so these are just a list of some of those um, programs and, and initiatives and in looking at just our vision of movement, so that I think of this as a movement, a constant movement where we're trying to go. Some of the areas we really want to pay attention and focus on is how do we tighten the centralization of campus equity programs? Seeing there's a lot of what's been shared here this morning that I've, I'm aware of and that the idea, idea committee is aware of. And there's a lot, there's some programs and, and initiatives that are happening on the campus that were new to me. And so I think that that speaks to how do we really tighten the centralization of this? Um, and how do we really like, yeah, just tighten that. Um, we wanna see the implementation, the success of our equity plan, of our nine point anti-racist plan, of our Emoja Equity Institute. Um, we also wanna see ongoing anti-racist and equity, equity alignment campus wide. So it's not just the IDEA committee, it's not just, um, Right, Emoja. It's not just these the different departments and that we've seen doing the training work today, but how are we making sure that's even going beyond campus wide, so that our board of trustees, our administration, our participatory governance are all that all have anti-racism and equity really center of um, all that we do, and to continue to to have equity, accessibility, anti-racism, and to talk about race and to really embody and normalize as a campus having these conversations, talking about how white supremacy shows up, you know, on our campus or in our communities. How do we really, you know, normalize talking about this so that this becomes just an expectation and a practice year round. I think about how we're in Black History Month right now. And I really, you know, we really as an idea community are like, this is something that Black history needs to be year round. When we're having um, our Comchella, our different programs happening on campus, are we looking at, are we hiring and making sure we're bringing in the representation of black folks, of people of color, of indigenous folks year round? One, one minute. Thank you. 
And then also um, having a web presence of all of our equity work here. There's so much happening and how can we make sure that that's, in, is, there, is there a way we can have it in one place, visually showing all the extraordinary work happening campus-wide here around our equity and anti-racist practices. And also idea, we need institutional line for funding. Right now, there's not a funding line with idea. Um, Dr. Kuhn has been our primary support for initiatives um, that are, and that are pushed forth by the idea committee. And I made it under time. So just want to thank you all again for um, being here today. And please reach out again, as I said, we as idea and me as equity coordinator, I want to know more, our, what programs are happening. How can I support that in my role and, and as as a committee of idea. So please um, be in touch um, of how we can really collaborate and really tighten um, the centralization of this. So thank you again so much. Thank you T and all the members of idea. Um, I'm reminded that we are really in challenging times and the water is very fast moving. And uh, I think in my reference to uh, the invitation of all, all of us paddling in the same direction, I think is now more important than ever. And I do rely on the idea committee for uh, consultation when we're thinking about messaging, putting out and, and the different kinds of things that we're doing. The nine point plan uh, is a prime example of that. So I think it's, a, a, I'm excited about the direction that idea is going and I'm excited about some of the ideas that you presented as well. So that brings us to, oh, okay, big, big applause for idea. I see you're offering them some great um, kudos in the chat box, which is what we wanna do. By looking at the time, I'm gonna be, this is now our 15 minute break. This is the lunch break, folks. Uh, we're actually doing pretty good on time since we're about halfway through. Uh, we're gonna reconvene at uh, 11.38. I think I did the math right, yes. 11.38, so go enjoy your time and we will come together at uh, reconvene at that time. Thanks so much.
It's 11.37 and we're going to get started in about one minute. So if you're behind the screens there, you'll know we'll be starting very soon. Thanks so much. Okay, I'd invite us all to return. I hope you had a, a good break, albeit brief, a little refreshment, had the opportunity to enjoy uh, seeing more of how uh, Karen's graphic recording is developing. We're going to move into, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six more presentations. I'm projecting, given where we're slightly about eight minutes behind in the schedule, that we'll probably wrap up around 1.15, unless we make up some time in these next groups. So. We're going to jump on in with the Professional Learning Committee uh, with Beth Patel. Beth. Hey. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, this is Beth Patel, and I'm representing the Professional Learning Committee. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Kuhn for organizing this. I think it's such a fantastic thing to be able to bring everyone together and to see what we're doing. Um, I would also like to give thanks to uh, the members of our Professional Learning Committee and for all of the work that they do. Um, the last presentation that we had before we left was with T and she dropped off by saying, you know, one of the things that's really important is like, how do we centralize all of these efforts that we have? And that's actually a perfect lead in to the Professional Learning Committee, because I really believe that the Professional Learning Committee has a, a key role in serving as a hub or as a centralized clearinghouse of all of the different uh, professional learning activities and equity activities that we're doing around campus. And I think it's really important to be hearing about these different uh, activities that are groups the groups are doing and then to bring those back to professional learning committee, help us to get those into the FLEX program, help us to publicize those on our professional learning website um, and to really just to be able to see all of the great things that we're doing together. Okay, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about the goal of the professional learning program. And uh, we've got three main uh, areas that we're looking at. And the first of all is to create a culture of learning across the college. And I've heard several other people today talk about how important it is to have that culture of learning and have a culture of, of equity mindedness across the, co the college. And that's the things that we're looking at as well. And this is going to be for all of our employees. We're looking at our faculty, our staff, and at our administrators about how we can do this and uh, to cultivate that. The second thing that we do is to really want to foster a sense of community and belonging among faculty, staff, and administrators through mentorship, which has been mentioned previously, and also that idea of having a shared purpose and values. Um, I think it's so fantastic that we have uh, really rooted equity in so much of what we're doing within the educational master plan and within the strategic plan. And uh, I think as long as we're working along the same path, it'll be much easier to get there. And finally, another of our goals for the uh, uh, Professional Learning Committee is to support the institutional practices that closely, uh, that close equity gaps and promote student achievement. So we really wanna be a part of those things. And I'd also like to say that this equity work is something, even though we're looking forward now, I'd like to take a moment and just to look back a little bit because uh, we've been working on some of these activities for quite a long time and it's great to see the continuing momentum. I think back to fall 2017, uh, where the Professional Learning Committee uh, organized a day-long equity summit with some of our partners from 3CSN that included, uh, was part of our Professional Learning Day for our classified staff and also included our faculty. And, uh, you know, during that day, it was, it was a great day, but we also, I remember from then, you know, like some of the discomfort that people felt talking about some of these issues. And I'm just so pleased at how far we've come. We're not past all of that, but we've certainly made a lot of progress. 
Okay, uh, I want to spend a little time talking about uh, our planning process for when we plan our flex activities and our classified professional learning activities. One of the big things that we have to do is first of all, identify some of the key initiatives. And that's why it's so important to look back at college plans like the educational master plan and the strategic plans. Uh, we want to also look at all of the different committee plans. We go back, we have an annual survey that we do each year and we have evaluations for all of our activities. What are people asking for? How are we providing that? What can we do better in that? Uh, we also go to looking at um, activities within the chancellor's office with the vision for success and guided pathways. Uh, how can we incorporate that into what we're doing? along with the various state initiatives we need to be aware of and different accreditation issues. So that's going to start off. Then we want to look more um, you know, at different committees on campus, the cabinet. Uh, we get a lot of guidance from our senates. Uh, Meg already presented earlier about the academic senate and some of the amazing things that they're doing. And again, we want to be able to take what they're doing, pull it in, be able to share that uh, with the group. We're excited now to be working with uh, the Emoji Equity Institute, as well, uh, but so many other groups, you know, SAS, uh, Psych Services, the library, uh, ELPS, and the list can go on about finding out what people are doing and what needs that we need to address. After we go through those first two uh, steps, uh, we begin to curate the offerings of what it is that we're presenting as part of our professional learning program. A big part of that is coming up with our, our learning themes for either the year or a particular event that we're doing, um, crafting uh, proposals and doing those in a very intentional way. Uh, to make sure that we're able to get the kind of proposals that we want to put out. Uh, again, and then finally looking at those submissions and scheduling things. Uh, and then finally, in the course of that, we want to promote and execute the programs that we're offering. Uh, a huge part of this has been uh, a big part of this help has been since we've uh, adopted pro learning in fall of 2017. This has now become a centralized place for us to put up our various offerings uh, for faculty and staff to be able to keep track of the activities that they're attending uh, and evaluate the programs that we do online. And so that's been a really great way to uh, uh, have that information centralized. And it also allows us to go back and say, hey, what were we doing three or four years ago? I remember previously I had lots of paper and binders with all kinds of information about our programs. And now this allows us to go back and pull information to see how many people are attending, uh, what kind of response we had for the activities that we did. Uh, we also uh, work closely with college services and marketing and communications uh, to promote those things. And then finally, we uh, review the outcomes of the different activities that we've had. Okay. Um, there are quite a number of things in the strategic plan and the educational master plan about dealing with professional learning. Again, uh, key idea is that it's an data-informed, equity-minded, ongoing professional development, uh, including everyone to meet the different equity goals that we have on campus. Uh, we wanna create those opportunities for faculty to collaborate and to share effective teaching methodologies. Uh, we've got a request to have a comprehensive integrated professional learning program. Currently, the PLC is in the middle of updating our professional learning plan. And that activity, along with even preparation for this summit, has been really great because it helps us to for focus our ideas and to put things down on paper and to see where we are going forward. Uh, finally, another key part of the strategic plan is about having a clear vision and a plan for a teaching learning center. And it's interesting that this has been something that's been part of the strategic plan actually for many years. And finally, with the uh, building, the new building that we're having on campus, we finally see the opportunity for this to come into fruition. And we're very excited about that. Okay. So again, you know, as, as I was saying, as part of our planning process, we're looking at those initiatives. I wanted, to, and then I said we use that to help us get our proposals. And I just want to include this uh, sample request for proposal that we actually use for spring 2021. Uh, how we uh, very intentional about including words like our, including ideas about being inclusive and equitable, uh, about looking at anti-racist teaching practices, about uh, having proposals that address issues of diversity 
diversity, inclusion, and social or just racial justice. And we do try to keep that high on the list just so that people can be aware of it and that we make sure that we're meeting some of the uh, uh, initiatives that were identified in our earlier activities. Okay. Um, after we have those requests for proposals go back, go out, then we bring back in the different activities. And what I've put on here is just a, uh, a list of some of the titles of our flex activities during our, our spring flex. And you can see the wide diversity of these. Uh, they go from things that we're doing in the classroom with our equity syllabus. What can faculty do in the classroom to make that classroom more equitable? Uh, we could have lots of programs throughout the college and we could be doing great things but so it's so important what actually happens in that classroom where we've got people in their seats or we've got people uh, engaging with us online making sure that they feel like they're in a safe place making sure they feel like they're in a supported place making sure that they know that we as faculty want them to be successful and we're helping them rather than setting up barriers to that. Uh, so things that are happening in the classroom. We also have things that we offer during Flex Week that are good for the wider community. Uh, one of the biggest attended uh, events during Flex Week was the activity about using trauma transformative principles to understand and change your workplace. Uh, this was set up in conjunction with Stormy Miller, uh, who brought in Larry Woodland, but it really gave all of us a lot of things to think about uh, and to kind of realize uh, how we can help students and also how can we can recognize and uh, deal with some things in our own workplace, maybe among our colleagues. And anytime we do those things, that helps for a more equitable uh, environment. Even though it may not say equity in there, we may not say equity, uh, you know, in big bold letters, but all of these kinds of things are uh, working toward equity and supporting student success. Uh, you'll know. also, oh, thank you. All right. Okay, uh, here I just gave a list again of some of the numbers. Uh, as others have said, it's really important to look at the numbers and to see how many people are attending and what exactly is happening. Um, and again, it's great to do that. Uh, with Flex, it's great because faculty actually have a, a mandatory obligation. Uh, so they need to be there. And we also have classified professional learning days where we have all hands and people are in there. So we know we have the opportunity to reach people. Okay. As we're looking forward in the future direction of what we want with our professional learning, uh, one of the big things that we want to do is decrease that number of ongoing activities. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, we brought in a keynote speaker uh, who talked about grading for equity. His name was Joe Feldman. After that, we had several sessions related to that and how it's important for helping our students. Uh, we recently done a thing about uh, raise the room, communities of practice, how to be better when we're giving, uh, working with our students via Zoom, some of the technology training that we're doing. And another area we'd like to do is to investigate more collaborations with PAC, UDWC, and the sabbatical committee, because those are other groups that are also giving money to help support professional development. And how can we create maybe some kind of a repository of information of what people are doing uh, and disseminate that information to the rest of the college? Okay, and finally, I just want to talk about the idea of, of the implementing plans for a teaching and learning center. And our goals for this are to be able to foster excellence and innovation in teaching, to advance equity-centered principles to increase student engagement and success, and also to promote a culture of continuous learning and collaboration, provide mentorship, and to train faculty in the effective use of technology. And uh, we're hoping uh, that with this, I, I go back to early on, Paul Dobemeyer was talking about the STEM Center and said, you know, if we build it, they will come. And uh, we're doing a lot of planning. And that's really my hope as well, that this could be really a hub of professional learning that could have a big impact on the culture of learning throughout the campus. And that it could be a way that we can all move forward and share ideas as we work to promote equity and student success at the college. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, very much. I, I, when I say this, I truly mean this, that our professional learning program has become the envy of other colleges. It's truly amazing. I had the opportunity to interact with a faculty member from Southern California yesterday and I'm telling her all about our 
professional learning committee and flex because she was in awe. So congratulations and big kudos to everybody in the professional learning committee and certainly Beth with your leadership. So thank you. I see lots of great uh, kudos to you in the chat box. So, okay, we're gonna move along then to uh, psychological services and uh, invite Stormy Miller back to introduce her team. Sorry, I'll, I'll share again. Okay, uh, so I am joined today uh, with uh, Dr. Danilo Musante and Anisa Rosa Sanchez, um, and we'll, uh, the three of us will be talking about psychological services and our work, uh, our equity and mental uh, health initiative in partnership uh, with Emoja and others. Uh, and, you know, I just want to take a moment to say while we're here today and we're hearing about uh, the collective efforts working towards equity, our continued work in that area, I think that it's critical to acknowledge that this has has been a, an incredibly challenging time for so many of us, right? As we're doing this heavy lifting, um, there have been so many things that we're also holding. We're holding the responsibility of caring for our families, concern around grief and loss, um, looking at our system and, and, and the spotlight on racial injustice, a systemic oppression, uh, seeing the experiences of those who are multiply marginalized, all of this to say that, you know, the struggle has been real um, and it's been uh, a lot to carry and it most definitely weighs on the emotional well-being and mental health of all of us. And when we think about mental health, you know, a lot of times folks can quickly go in this direction of diagnosis, but what we know is we all hold uh, mental well-being and mental health, right? And this is this is challenging for so many of us. And so I say that, you know, and, and want to also just extend a big thanks to our mental health counselors and who's not listed, um, our clinical trainee, Ariel Perloff, um, Juliet Blank and SAS, who also doubles as a mental health counselor. They're, they have certainly seen their share of students in need, as you all have as well in the classroom, as you're providing support services, there's full recognition that people are struggling, not only students, but faculty and staff in our entire community. So that we approach this work, um, working towards collective healing, healing justice is really critical to really center this work around well-being. Since 2018, beginning of 2018, psychological services made a big shift in the way that we were approaching our work and really thinking about policy and practice that reduces stigma associated around with student mental health challenges, but also being very proactive in our approach and prioritizing the, the, need, the mental health needs of students of color. And so that's primarily been our focus and I'm sure that you've seen in our outreach efforts and our programming and our conversations with students, faculty, staff and community members. That's really where we've been placing the emphasis because we, we're fully aware of the inequities that lie in terms of access to mental health services and also acknowledging the experiences of those that have been multiply marginalized and those um, who are suffering from racial trauma. When we talk about this framework, as much as I'd like to say that psychological services created it, um, we did not. We are really relying on the um, Jed Foundation and Steve Fund and the recommendations that they have provided to institutions around equity and mental health that talk about promoting mental health and well-being of students of color campus-wide, that it not just live in your wellness services or psych services, but that it be embodied by the entire community. That we really rely on the voices of students in terms of what mental health services looks like, who provides those services? How do we do that in partnership? We recognize the importance of having clinical professionals on staff, but we also want, know that each of us have play a role in really promoting well being and supporting students and students supporting each other. Actively recruiting, training, and ret retaining a diverse 
and culturally competent faculty and professional staff is really critical to this work. As we talk about representation and who's providing these services, it's important as we see an increase in, in students of color that our faculty and staff are reflective of that. And so we, we look at that as well in our mental health service delivery. And we also think about where are their opportunities to continue that work, clinical trainees, part-time faculty to full-time faculty. Creating dedicated roles and support well-being and success of students of color. I would say that this, you know, in terms of our uh, equity and mental health series and our, our and using that framework, it has been a true privilege and honor to partner with Emoja and to work with uh, Patty France and Yashika Crawford and Colleen Myhall have and, and, and the rest of the psychological services team to really say that we're a core group of folks that are committed to equity and mental health and how can we collaborate and how can we extend beyond the work that we're doing to engage with learning communities and others. Um, we've partnered more with ASCOM and, and really looking at these ways that we can um, have dedicated roles and commitment of folks to, to carry out this work. Helping students learn about programs and services um, by advertising and promoting has been, you know, I think that's one of the things that is, has been a blessing and a resource during this time, being able to leverage social media, being able to uh, cross promote um, is one strategy that we've used and engaging the community. And then identifying and utilizing culturally relevant and promising programs and practices and collecting data on the, the effectiveness. Uh, you know, alignment with the EMP and strategic plan, we think about our evening services and when students need that level of support, we quickly transitioned like so many of you all who pivoted and now we're providing telemental health services. Fortunately, we had an EMR system, a medical record system in place to really support that work. Our collaboration internally and externally with folks like County Behavioral Health and Side by Side have really supported us being able to leverage our ability to provide mental health services at COM. Uh, outreaching to high school, com other community-based organizations, every event that we have put on has been an opportunity with the exception of one that's exclusively for students. Every event has been an opportunity to convene uh, community conversations around equity and mental health. In terms of student services, uh, students served that can fluctuate. Uh, 1920, it was 99 students served, 72 intakes. I think it's important to note that many of these students are returning weekly, bi-weekly, are in frequent co contact with mental health counselors seeking support. In terms of the resources allocated and needed, I've shared a little bit about who's a part of the team. Danilo Musante is our full-time uh, faculty, Anisa Rosa Sanchez part-time, and then we also have uh, an SAS counselor providing mental health support and a clinical trainee. We also have a memorandum of understanding with Side by Side, which has allowed us to do programming by Call to Courage, which is a group space to really center um, center conversations around health, um, cultural experiences, and really for students of color to come in a space and feel like they can be heard and discuss their own individual experiences as it relates to mental health and well-being. We're thinking about the incredible need and our, our desire to um, increase our staffing. So it would be wonderful to be, to be able to have two full-time psychologists, to have more clinical trainees, to um, be able to, um, to a greater degree leverage, you know, being able to have a, a counselor with both in student accessibility services and in mental health services. We're reimagining the service delivery and model um, and, and look forward to the collaboration with uh, health services and student accessibility services as we shift to this wellness model, which can really come into fruition when we have, our, have the new building in place, the new LRC. And um, really utilizing a collective approach to healing and well-being, which relies, as I've shared, on all of us to play an instrumental role in that part in, on that, in, that part in terms of supporting students and really ourselves as well as we think about uh, uh, our, our colleagues. So I'm out of breath, <laughs> aiming not to run out of time this time, and, and, it, and I'll pass it on to 
Danila and uh, Anissa to talk about some of the highlights and accomplishments and, and carry us forward. And just so not to interrupt you in a minute, you got about six minutes left. Awesome, thank you. Okay, hopefully I'm coming in here. All right, um, and uh, we've got our, our, stop, our stopwatch going. Thank you, thank you, Stormy. Um, so talking a little bit, so Stormy highlighted, um, you know, some of the, uh, gave us a, a great intro and background to a lot of the work that's being done in psychological services and focusing specifically on, you know, individual students who come in and who we provide supports to on a more individual basis, both in, in uh, ongoing therapy throughout the semester or year, or perhaps a few sessions of checking in and, um, or, um, working uh, collaterally with, with other providers or other agencies to provide support to the students, more case management or working with SAS. So on top of all of that happening all, you know, behind closed doors, um, so, so to speak these days, um, there's also a whole arm of the work that we're doing in psychological services um, that's on a, a broader, <laughs> moving us right along, yeah, thanks, on a, on a, on a broader scale of uh, reaching the uh, campus community um, and reaching students, um, perhaps who may who may not already be engaged in services, who may not be familiar with kind of mental health supports, may not have may not be engaged in them now, or may not have ever. And so, thinking about um, reaching students in that way, and we know that um, there's a lot of data um, about folks of color um, inequities in terms of folks of color receiving supports and folks of color um, getting uh, uh, engaging in supports at lower levels and rates. Um, and so when we so when we're thinking about that, we're not just um, we know that 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 disparity exists that we have many students of color engaging in our services, which is great. But we know that a disparity exists and wanting to also go out to students and reach them in in other spaces um, and in other ways than just um, having them come in to support. So all that to say, we have um, a bunch of programs that planned and that we've already done. Um, it uh, began several years ago with our equity. Um, or uh, I, we, we began an equity mental health initiative specifically several years ago in collaboration with, um, with the Emoja team. And as an outgrowth of that work and our first, um, uh, I, our first program um, in, that, on, in, that, in terms of that work was um, our event several years ago with Dr. Kevin Coakley um, entitled The Psychological Impact of Racism and the Imposter Syndrome on Mental Health. And um, so in programs like this, all highlighted here, um, uh, we've been able to, you know, do work increasing awareness and, and decreasing stigma, stigma around mental health and hopefully bringing in folks, um, you know, addressing mental health at a more community level and bringing in folks who may not, may not be familiar with mental health or, or in, terms of, in terms of mental health resources and supports. I um, also wanted to highlight our work with um, Art with Impact. Um, and the, the work that they do in, in, in many programs that we've done um, entitled Movies for Mental Health, also sort of getting at mental health in a, in a different way and using art in this case um, to, to talk about um, mental health and well-being. Um, we, uh, so we've done several events. Those are yearly programs that we do. Um, and um, as Stormy had mentioned, also a collaboration with Side by Side that, um, that um, that Beth also was referencing in, in her in her presentation, um, and that is a, a new partnership that we have um, beginning at the end of last year, and we've started this program entitled Call to Courage, um, that's specifically for students and for BIPOC students in particular, um, and we're running it again this semester, um, and uh, that has focus topics um, in each session specifically aimed at and um, uh, topics that are relevant and. and helpful uh, for BIPOC folks in particular um, coming up. We have one focused on identity, culture, and privilege, um, also restorative practices, so a variety of topics. Um, so, so all kinds of ways where we're really trying to think about how to reach students and how to address mental health needs on the campus community more broadly. Um, there's, uh, I could talk on and on about that, but I know we, we are limited in time. So uh, Stormy, do you wanna um, advance and I'll just talk briefly. Um, about the about the uh, so the, the great events we have coming up, and the first one being next week. And these are events out of our um, the, the first one next week on Tuesday is uh, out of our collaboration with um, with the 
uh, Art with Impact. It's entitled Poetry for Mental Health, and it has a, a focus on the LGBTQIA plus population, celebrating One minute. exploring. One minute. All right. So, uh, Stormy, do you want to just move us through? It looks like we're almost done. So this is our Call to Courage program and Black Mental Health Matters program. Um, and I have talked for, for way too long, and I, I know we were um, wanting to, I also wanted to include um, Anissa and have, get her have a chance to speak. So, Anissa, do you want to speak kind of briefly at pulling out perhaps some of the in, institutional accountability pieces we were wanting to speak on in, in, in uh, th thinking about visions for the future and some of our work? Uh, yeah, I'll try to make this as quick as possible. We're running out of time. Um, so part of what I was gonna speak about was just how we take institutional accountability and in the well-being of all of our students. And so what that looks like in prioritizing the mental health needs of all students with uh, particular attention to students of color and those that are multiply marginalized bridging the work as as my colleagues have stated and making it really everyone's priority um, and conceptualizing these opportunities as spaces for healing uh, really uh, that's centered around um, social justice and healing justice and recognizing uh, the value of mental health professionals in these spaces um, you know because we're doing this work all the time um, Daniil and I and, and Stormy and Juliet and our trainee, we, we talk about uh, centering social justice uh, as part of the framework of psychological services and SAS all the time. It's not something that we just sort of dip in and out of. It's, it's just, it really is the center of our work. And we wanted to just highlight that today um, because it drives so many of uh, not just our conversations, but of the work we do with students and the events that we plan behind the scenes. Um, so maybe we can have that sure, be the last sure. comment, but thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Great, um, Anissa, thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off. I've got to be fair, I've got to be equitable here today, right? Of with course, time. of course, so, okay. thank you. <laughs> so, uh, obviously such invaluable work across the board and thank you all very much. Uh, I think incredible presentation, incredible work that you're doing. Let's make sure that we give them some appreciation out there in the chat box. And we'll look forward to, to participating in some of the events going forward. Okay, with that, we're moving along here. And we are now uh, to EEO and inviting uh, Nikki Harris back. Hello, everyone. It's me again. Um, Stormy is going to be navigating for us this morning. Um, First, I would like uh, to say how proud I am of this committee and just over the last, you know, three to four years to actually have um, created a plan and, and implemented it is a, is, a, is a big step for the College of Moran. Um, Starting next, star, next uh, slide, please. Um, so the, the advisory council, um, was established in 2016, but the EEO plan really focuses on um, the district efforts and commitment to achieve equal employment opportunity in the workforce, academic programs and activities in compliance with government code section 12940. The district through its educational efforts, policies, procedures, and program planning is taking active steps to ensure that its employees and students are afforded equal employment opportunity. Next slide, Stormy. So our advisory um, committee um, consists of um, 10 members and three resources. Um, Dr. Stormy Miller and Ryan Byrne is the, co the administrator that leads the committee in addition to um, three faculty members, two classified professional and two students, which we are grateful and um, enjoy having their insight to our processes and procedures and the planning process related to updating the EEO plan. Next slide, Stormy. So the EEO plan is actually required to be updated um, every three years. And we're in a process in the final stage of, of updating the plan. Um, the plan is literally uh, an avenue for the next three years of our efforts around 
um, recruitment, recruitment policy procedures and um, non-discrimination um, policies. Um, the plan reflects the district commitment to equal opportunity and its recruitment and hiring policies and practice prudent to the applicable Title V regulations and creating a welcoming work environment, affirming as well as one another free of bias and discrimination. The plan updates include building effective and efficient EEO efforts by aligning um, the Office of General Counsel Equity Equal, Equal and Employment Opportunity Latitude data. Um, and I want to highlight um, the pre department for helping this uh, pull together quite a bit of data over the last three years that we've been doing um, for as our hiring and retention processes here at the college. Um, alignment with the educational net master plan, the nine multiple methods. Um, is essential to the EEO plan. Um, it focuses on pre-hiring, post-hiring, um, and hiring. And that includes board policies and procedures and, and adopted resolutions, incentives for hard to fill um, positions and disciplines, focus outreach and publications for hiring, um, procedure for addressing diversity throughout the hiring steps and levels, um, consistent and ongoing training for hiring committees, uh, professional development focused on diversity and diversity incorporated into our in criteria for employee evaluations and tenure review. And the last one will be grow your own program. And as you all saw today in our in these presentations, we have quite a few programs that are growing, uh, especially on the academic senate side of the house, which the EEO committee um, will be partnering with, and I myself partner with quite a bit on um, seeing that come to fruition. Um, our, this, the, the EEO plan uh, committee focuses on the educational um, master plan goal two, which we'll hear more of that throughout the presentation. And then of course, I think the major um, component of the plan is just ensuring um, that it's updated every three years um, in between the last two or three years, um, the district has been awarded over $100,000 from the Chancellor's Office due to our efforts. And I believe you have seen some of that through the recent Rice Award um, that we received. Okay, Stormy. Okay. So here are just a few highlights and accomplishments, um, one being, and T referenced it as well, the, the opportunity to partner with IDEA and uh, really be a part of the development of the uh, that call to action and outcomes uh, for anti-racism and equity. So uh, to kick off the academic year that way was an incredible start and, and wonderful to work and collaborate with IDEA and Dr. Kuhn. Our membership as part of the advisory has really blossomed this year and you know we're just so fortunate as Nikki mentioned to have three student representatives serving on the committee where our classified staff our faculty administrators there's just a high level of commitment to this work and you'll be hearing from some of the advisory members today. Um, we've worked really hard this year to, to really focus our priorities and establish priority areas to, to flesh out the EEO plan. Um, and, and we'll share more of what that looks like and that work and how it really aligns with much of what has been covered today. And then um, we're, some of our next steps uh, really speak to finalizing the EEO plan, which is soon to come. But before we even get there, it's a matter of connecting with you all uh, and, and really getting input from respective groups uh, to ensure that uh, we're we're in alignment institutionally, we're all in support before we can carry it uh, forward and finalize that plan. Here are priority areas. I won't spend time on this slide because each respective area will be speaking to the priorities. We have four of them. And Alex could not join us for this portion of the presentation, but Alex Jones is our priority uh, area one lead uh, around pipeline development. And we've heard about the faculty diversity internship program. Uh, we know that uh, embedded in the Moja Equity Institute, there's part of uh, classified uh, pipeline development. And so 
there's full recognition from EEO that we're not carrying all of this work. We are in support of the work. We want to partner in this work. We want to assist where we can because it does align with the chancellor's office multiple methods and what we have to speak to as part of the EEO plan. And it really does support the district in terms of funding and just the recognition that we're, we're in alignment. So knowing what you're doing, how you're doing it, and supporting you in that work is really critical. So we're looking at pipeline development from, from multiple levels. We're thinking about the students that we serve who may be interested in exploring careers in post-secondary education and at COM. How are we creating opportunities for them to, be, to develop professionally, professionally and potentially come back and work at COM or other respective institutions within the California Community College system or beyond? How are we developing internal processes to upskill uh, current classified staff um, who may wish to be faculty, um, pursue additional education, who are thinking about administrator roles. Um, so career mapping and thinking about options in that area. And then also building out interim roles and thinking about uh, administrators, folks in management that are thinking about what's the next step. How are we creating opportun opportunities within the institution to support that development? And I will pass it on to Ryan. Thank you, Stormy. So EEO priority area two addresses action step 1.4, hiring protocols are changed so that EEO rep is present during screening committee convenings. So what is an EEO rep? Uh, the EEO rep basically monitors the screening process and interviewing of applicants and certifies the screening committee process for EEO compliance. Um, ideally, all members of the screening committees are serving this function. But to start off, we need to make sure that we have equity-minded folks across the district to help support this function. So at this time, we haven't yet established a formalized process or procedure to have an EEO rep on each screening committee, but that's what we're working on. So this subcommittee's work, each uh, committee of this, each member of the subcommittee is reaching out um, and researching best practices with regard to EEO reps at other colleges and institutions. Uh, reviewing the board policies and administrative procedures of those colleges and districts. Um, and we're gonna be coming back with recommendations uh, regarding language um, and, and just how we would implement that. So challenges include bandwidth, comma, with some, some incentives, uh, expanding and uh, scaling training. Uh, the, in terms of next steps, the, the committee is going to be bringing best practices to our next meeting, uh, and we'll be reviewing that, and we hope to have uh, recommendations on how to carry this out with recommended policy language by April. Just over five minutes left. I'll pass it on to Manny. Okay, maybe we'll just um, pause on priority three. We'll, um, we'll come back to it um, and try to get Manny connected and then we'll go to priority four. Hi, um, am I on? So You're on. Okay, thanks. So um, I'm covering priority four and you know we just started this work and this really is looking at ways that we can incentivize and get the best applicants applying at College of Marin. And so looking at what are incentives that we can use in order to, um, to attract um, applicants that we want candidates for our positions. And so some of the things that we are um, looking at, and this is sort of a brainstorming session. So we're still working at uh, looking at these items, um, but looking at flexible remote work hours. And that's, you know, thinking about increased access to technology and connectivity, and just really giving um, flexible options for um, our employees. Um, we're talking at looking at education um, subsidies, maybe tuition reimbursement, financial support toward advancing education, um, really trying to inspire um, and encourage those people already working at College of Marin um, to move forward or to think about other options and then to um, take on other positions at College of Marin. Um, transportation is certainly an issue. We, a lot of people are commuting. So uh, one of the things that we discussed are stipends for public transportation, fuel, tolls, things like that. 
um, career development opportunities. Um, we've talked about maybe shadowing um, other positions, um, mentoring, uh, as well as career mapping for employees to look at what are their options going forward, where are places for growth and development, formalizing um, the internships or grow your own pipeline uh, for classified and faculty, and really encouraging again, the talent that we have at College of Marin to think about you know, other options and helping to grow our employees at the campus. Um, looking at considering ways that we can provide childcare assistance. Um, and then specifically, you know, all of these things will hopefully encourage um, people of color to apply, but we also wanna make sure that we're focusing specifically on people of color to diversify our staff and faculty at College of Marin. So providing information to prospective candidates on local identity focused organizations, um, providing tours for the community members um, with a member of the team, kind of a buddy system to help um, and really looking at our um, hiring process. You know, can we have some events and job fairs at Calm? So really bringing people onto the campus to have interactions, they can meet us, find out that we're wonderful, great people and they want to work here. Um, and so, and other options like cluster hires and things like that. So we're really trying to look at a lot of different options and then housing everyone um, that's also on there and looking at that tiered um, support for housing, you know, rental assistance, um, assistance with buying and partnerships and those kinds of things. So um, if you have ideas, let us know of other ideas you have because we are expanding on, on this as well. Thanks. Okay. Manny with us? I'll just quickly cover priority three and Manny King and uh, Dawood Anderson Zavir have really taken the lead um, with EEO visibil visibility via web page, newsletters, um, and just the way that we uh, present data. And much of it has been said in terms of web presence, how are we collectively uh, sharing the good work that we're doing as it relates to uh, our equity efforts and EEO. So building out some of these areas, media presence, it really does support our ability to um, recruit potential folks. They're, they're looking at our website. They're trying to find out who we're about, um, culturally get a sense of the institution. And when we have um, a greater visibility and web presence and share our EEO work, it really does support our efforts in terms of uh, recruitment and diversifying our faculty and staff. And one minute. And I'll pass it to Nikki. And um, once again, thank you, Stormy and um, the team for um, given a, a, a summary of what the work that's been done. I think one of the things the committee has been really focusing on the last few um, you know, months and last year is really finding out what a work is being done at in the college and how do they impact and we connect that. I think one of the major opportunities we found was creating some type of flow chart or organizational chart that shows the various ways leading back to the mission, the educational plan, master plan, what that work has been done, like a visual um, for people to really see how everyone plays a role in equal employment opportunity. Um, you know, identifying work groups or constituent groups with support pre-hiring, hiring and post-hiring processes and a collective ability to carry out the plan, um, it takes a village. It's not just one person's job, it's the whole institution. We all have the equity-minded lens on, um, so we want to kind of engage in that. Um, the Chancellor's Office recently developed a new uh, pipeline uh, project with um, historically backed colleges and universities that's coming out. So as I mentioned, I'm very pleased to see some of the work coming out of the Chancellor's Office, especially with connection to the vision of um, success. Um, we're going to have to end it on that note. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> it kills me. I'm telling you, it kills me. Anyway, so uh, great work, EEO team. I continue to appreciate you and look for. I've read the first part of the first draft of the plan. I look forward to reading about the other four initiatives that we just covered. So give them some appreciation out in the chat box. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we're going to move on now to our next presentation, uh, which is Puente. We had the opportunity to celebrate Puente's 10th anniversary about two years ago, and I believe we have uh, Blaze and Luce with us today. Hi, everyone. I think it's, no, it's not morning, it's afternoon. Okay, so we're going to get started. So, um, 
You can go ahead and go to the next one. So my name is Luz. I am the Puente counselor. I know Blaze is here, and so she'll introduce herself in a minute. Um, so Puente has been around since 1981. It is um, at various UCs, um, 65, uh, actually 65 California Community Colleges. Um, it is sponsored through our chancellor's office. It's at um, high schools, middle schools, at College of Marin in particular. We have it starting at English 150 in the fall with a counseling class and then English 155 and a counseling class that the same group of students continue to in the spring. So it is a complete um, one year learning community that the same group of students stay in for uh, a full year. So the um, focus of the program is to increase its number of educationally disadvantaged students to receive their four year degrees and then return to their communities um, as leaders and role models. And we'll go into more details about the program. So in 2020, we had about 114 students enrolled in the Puente program. We enroll about 25 to 30 students each year. Um, so it is open to anyone to enroll in. Um, as I mentioned previously, they are in a full year pro, a full year of English and counseling. Um, the English class itself has a Latin X theme um, and issues, authors that they will focus on. And then the counseling component to the class, um, that is where the students will be working with myself on how to prepare for transfer, what do they need to transfer. And then we do have a, um, the Puente model has a mentoring component. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. We also do, um, college visits um, that the students go on. Obviously, when we weren't in a pandemic, we physically went to them. Uh, you'll see various pictures uh, of some of the visits that we took. And this semester, we'll have interesting virtual visits that we'll be doing. So um, we have peer mentors, and then we have um, some professional mentors that our students are paired with every year. So we're lucky to have um, College of Marin faculty, staff, and administrators that are some of our mentors. Um, and then we also have local professionals from a variety of careers that are our mentors. And the students get to meet with them one-on-one -on -one, um, for a variety of you know, um, academic and uh, personal support. And we also have um, support from the statewide office for our mentoring component and, and professional uh, events that our mentors get to attend. Actually, there's one uh, event coming up that is really exciting for our mentors to, to attend. Uh, Blaze and I um, usually typically planned, uh, plan events for our mentors. So you could see some of those that we have there. Uh, and um, some of the events include allowing our um, mentors to meet with and and um, meet some of the parents of our um, students. So uh, that is kind of exciting for the students, the parents, and the mentors to be able to meet at least a couple times in the year. Um, and then we have at least three to four of our um, peer mentors that are students that were previously in the program and are then um, providing services to our students. And so you could see the list of um, staff, myself included, um, Blaze, and then others that are involved, um, that are involved in the program. Um, and then these are the different um, resources that we currently are um, existing resources that you have going down. I, you can kind of see what we have, but I, I would rather kind of focus on some of the other things that we are doing just because I know we have limited time. Um, 
So these are some of the things that we've listed that are going to be needed or that we'd like or additional resources. Um, we'd like to have additional paid student interns. Um, family is a big component of our students and um, providing additional family resources um, regarding transferring uh, it is something that our students continue to say would be a great resource. Um, financial literacy um, for families and students in Spanish and English is something that is, is greatly needed and would, and would be appreciated. Um, continued um, or additional career major support. A lot of our students continue to change their major just like most um, college students, um, but continued exposure to di different careers, new careers, um, and providing support for our students after they finish the, the year program would be um, something that we've talked about. Um, our students tend to um, need ample space um, to study, uh, collaborate, work on. Um, and so that's something we've mentioned here. And a uh, learning community coordinator would be great just to continue to support the program. Um, and these are some of the alignments that we currently have and want to continue to um, work with in the program. So EOPS, STEM, um, Amoja, and um, the de designated tutors with the English department and math. All right, I'm gonna take over now. We got a couple slides about some of our achievements. The program has been on campus since 2008. So we've got some nice things to talk about. We've done some research compared to similar uh, college of students. Our Puente students are more likely to persist and succeed, persist to the next semester, more likely to succeed in English, more likely to stay enrolled, more likely to become transfer prepared, more likely to complete degrees. And just so you know, all the photos on this PowerPoint are our students. Um, here's some nice charts we got from the statewide office. Uh, so since 2011, we've had 95 students transfer that they've been able to track. About half of them go to CSU, about a third to C, uh, UC, and the rest of private or out of state. Um, looks like our number of transfers has increased over time. And that uh, it's really important that they're getting through faster. The average time to a degree at college in is 6.6 years. We are getting students to transfer about 18% within two years and 60% within four years. Um, so that's a huge service that we're providing. But beyond their academic achievements, we're really proud of their students in student leadership. Um, over the past uh, five years, and I don't know before that, uh, but I just asked for the past five years, we've had 14 Puente students who have served in ASCOM leadership. Currently, four of our students are officers. Two have been student trustees. Four have been student ambassadors. We have quite a few students who are MAPS mentors or tutors. They work, they volunteer, they've been keynote speakers, commencement speakers. You may recognize some of them from this PowerPoint. They've been on our schedules. Um, they volunteer in after school programs, they translate, they are helping out, they're marching for Black Lives Matters. Um, they're out there. In fact, the woman here in the middle is B, and she's in student leadership right now. She's the vice president. And they're also in one of our peer mentors. Yeah, and, and also athletes. Oh yes, yeah, so we have quite a few athletes. Um, here's a, just a quick slide where we thought we, we connected with the Ed Master Plan specifically around our efforts to improve um, persistence with the peer mentoring, uh, the uh, intensive counseling support until they transfer. Um, and also we get a lot of equity focused professional development through Puente every semester. It's required and it's fabulous. Um, and also just the program by, by touching the families and the students, we are helping to generate a college going culture. We keep getting um, people. I had a student whose mom I also had. I had her mom in about 2010, 2009 or 10. And then um, Raquel, I'm like, wait a minute, I had your mom. So um, we get cousins, we get siblings, we get family members. Uh, we're touching the whole community more than um, you might realize. Here are some of our challenges. This is last year's cohort. You might recognize Felix there at the bottom. He works a lot up at the farm actually right now. Um, we could use more accurate tracking and data collection. It's an issue particularly because we often have students who don't have social security numbers. Um, we only have one cohort per year. So we're only serving 25 to 30 in that intensive year even though there's about a hundred plus on campus because they continue their studies. Five minutes. 
it can be difficult to um, serve the students who are, are what we call phase three after we've had that intensive year with them. We, they still need a lot of help. It can be difficult to get them what they need. And it would be really nice if we um, could expand our outreach and visibility. Here are some future directions. We just did a program review process with lots of help from some people who will hopefully be on our Puente Advisory Council, which we hope to set up. Uh, we wanna have help the students revitalize the Puente Club. It's really their bailiwick, uh, but they could use some energy. Um, we wanna develop an online Puente alumni network, which no one else has done, but we'd love to do. Puente at statewide level was talking about training content and structures outside of the two core faculty members to spread the pedagogical uh, equity focus um, around the campus more. We'd love to do that. We'd love to have a second cohort starting a little bit lower. Now that we start at 150, there are students at the 120 level coming out of ESL, coming out of basic skills, who could use, are just starting a, a one level below transfer more support. And there was discussion of a new Latinx focused learning community it wouldn't be, would be connected to Puente, but to really focus more on students in ESL and basic skills. Um, lots of opportunities for collaboration to build on. We've already worked some with maps and outreach. Love to see some community service projects that we do with other learning communities. Our students get very equity minded as a result of our program. And it would be nice to say, here, go help with the detention centers. Here, go volunteer over here. There's a, there's a movement for change and you wanna be part of it. And they do, they just don't have the links to get there. Uh, we've been collaborating with like some more with the STEM Center, Transfer Center, Emoja Equity Institute, and of course, EOPS. So finally, just spread the word. Here's our contact information. Part of our visibility is that all of you know what we offer. We really help students prepare for transfer. We help them become leaders. We, we create a community that stays. Um, and some of you have been our mentors. And so you know how lovely it is to get to know our students. And uh, I just have to say, it's kind of heartbreaking that here we are in this semester or this year, I have never met my students in person. They're a fabulous group. Um, maybe someday next fall I will, but um, anyway, that's what we have to say about Puente. And then I just wanna plug that if you are so inspired, you are welcome to contact Blazer Eye if you wanted to become a mentor yourself. Thank you both, great presentation. Thank you, Blaze, thank you, Luz. I, I will say I have been a mentor over the years off and on, uh, and I am on this year, and I really enjoyed the experience and met, met some great students over the years. And I also really appreciate the focus on family because I can't think within the Latinx community a, a more important uh, connection to make. So thank you very much. Okay, show your appreciation out in the chat box, which I see some happening there. We've got two more presentations. So we're gonna move on now to student activities and advocacy and another return presenter, Sadika. Actually, this is Sadika's first presentation. We can pretend I already went, that's, that's okay too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello everyone, thanks for sticking around. I know we're in the final stretch, so I appreciate so many people still being here. So I'm representing student activities and advocacy and certainly um, am not the one who does all the wonderful work that comes out of this office. So I wanna commend my team who consists of T. Perales, who you all heard from earlier, our equity and activities coordinator, Nakisha Dyer, who is our administrative assistant and Matthew Kent, who have provided so much support around um, basic needs, comp care, and he is our student conduct officer. But we've all kind of changed some hats during this time. So I wanna just give them big kudos before I start. So in terms of who we are and what we do, centering equity, this is what this summit is all about. Um, but I really wanna hone in on what we're doing and, and what that looks like in student activities and advocacy. This is the statement, this is the philosophy from which we work, but I highlighted a few items here around cultivating opportunities to empower and strengthen student participation through active engagement, and then really wanting to have all students that engage with us enhance their critical thinking and communication skills within the context of social, cultural, inter intellectual interactions, and understanding the responsibility for oneself and the community, which is so relevant to the ways that we talk about equity and how we implement equity at the college. You've already seen this slide, which lets you know that T and I are, are always thinking about where is equity? How are we integrating it? Um, when we think about what the, this means for the college and then trickle down to all the departments, including our own, you know, white supremacy, racism and oppression, it doesn't always have to be these overt, uh, very uh, visible symbols of what that looks like, but it shows up in different ways where it is you know, covert and it is um, overt. So I wanted to make sure I shared the pyramid there. 
and also considering what is it that we're doing? What, what kind of philosophy are we integrating? And I've shared this slide in a different presentation, but when we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and those basic resources that our students need to feel safe, to, be, to feel like they can thrive, um, I, I learned this in the Equities Pathways Conference and I appreciated this. And so I wanted to share this around the indigenous ideology of the medicine wheel. And Stormy and her team you know, spoke about this a little bit about holistic care, right? It's beyond just the resources, but what are we thinking about physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally? Our students are handling so much right now and are, have always been handling so much, but it really is coming to light right now in the pandemic. So social justice in action really is something that I believe that our office does and does very well. You know, we are, we work through the framework and understanding that procedures and practices in all institutions of higher education, including College of Marin, they're rooted in white supremacy. That's what higher education was created for. That's who it was opened up to. Um, and so it is our job, it's our responsibility to counter and dismantle this through creating equitable access and support through all that we offer in our office. We have a lot going on at all times, but I wanted to highlight the three kind of larger areas and try to fit in as much as I could. So this first area of programs, events, and leadership, these are some of the bigger events and programs that we offer. And we've offered that prior to the pandemic and continue to offer this through the pandemic in a virtual environment, which has been pretty unbelievable. And if, if you, any of you have come to any of the events or programs that our office has put on, student government has put on, you can see that I feel like the innovation is still there. Our students and our staff are really trying to recreate and continue to create the spaces of belonging for our students. So some of the highlights for us when we think about equity, social justice, our Women of Color Cafe, Cutie Pie Cafe, which is our queer and trans um, folks of, uh, space uh, that we created, Welcome Week, Healing Spaces. So when I think about uh, 2016, when the Trump administration came on board, there was quite a bit of fear and concern in particular in our undocumented and um, immigrant populations. And so we held healing spaces in collaboration with other offices. And this is something that we intentionally do because we wanna think about who are historically marginalized communities who are currently and continue to feel impact of the legislation, of the changes, of the procedures that are happening. In addition, <clears throat> the Chancellor's Office every year has the Undocumented Student Week of Action and our office has led that um, with various events and definitely have had EOPS um, really do some heavy lifting as well. So kudos to them. And the T. Perales has created our LGBTQ plus Braver space, space Training, which is really taken off. And we provide regular flex and classroom presentations. And um, thank you to Puente for always inviting us. Uh, it is, I think that's the reason why we see so much ASCOM participation is because you all have collaborated intentionally. And then ASCOM Student Government. I think that this is a huge highlight and accomplishment for us. When I started five years ago, I think ASCOM had a very different presence on the campus, maybe not as much of a presence, but we have moved to a point where our board of trustees are acknowledging our students in a way where they see them they hear them and are really appreciating um, the impact that they're making. And also just the collaborations they're having with Academic Senate, with um, the cabinet, it, it's, it's different. And so I feel really proud of that. Um, and then considering our basic needs and comp care. So this one, most people hear about right now because this is where we're seeing the greatest visible and, uh, need around what our students are dealing with. And, for this, I wanted to share that we do use a restorative justice approach. So we look at the behavior of a person, not the personhood. And I think that that philosophy has really shifted the way conduct has looked since I arrived five years ago. We did used to have a heavier conduct load and now we have a more calm care load, which means that we are looking at how are we supporting our students holistically and considering th that there is a greater need from the infrastructure of what our campus can offer, but then what our students are going through. And when we meet those needs of our students, we find that they thrive. So a strategic plan and master plan and where our find our alignment. I wanna share this quote with everyone because I think that this is a big telling to what we're working on and, and um, I appreciate it and I'm reading this book. So I continue to add her, her insights and wisdom. If we begin to understand ourselves as the practice ground for transformation, we can transform the world. And just being here today, uh, Tia said this, in terms of being inspiring, I do believe we are doing this. Our alignment with the strategic plan, our educational master plan, um, I, these are kind of the bigger highlights, but I feel like we have different elements infused throughout. 
reducing barriers and creating a welcoming atmosphere with increased human contact. This is something we um, really strive to do through Welcome Week and throughout all our programs. And Welcome Week really started in 2015 when I arrived. We didn't seem to have kind of a cohesive program that existed. And we find that students are tapping into it and continue to tap into it while we're in a virtual environment. Decrease towards elimination of existing racial equity gaps. The college being a leader in promoting equity throughout the county. We have quite a few partnerships in the county. And then make the college a center for community engagement and cultural enrichment. Over this time that we have been virtual, we have invited campus partners to come to our events and then also just opened it up with the Zoom link so that our students in high schools can also attend. So our reach. Um, this is highlighting kind of the overarching larger programs that we have. And I didn't put how many people in total, but really how many people and employees or how many students and employees have been attending these different events and when they started. Our Women of Color Cafe and Cutie Pie um, Cafe have really targeted this, these two populations because as we know, folks of color um, and folks who are identified as LGBTQ+, these are communities that have you know, been marginalized and, and have struggled within the higher ed environment. And I do wanna name that LGBTQ folks have, ex have extensive increase in mental health and um, uh, just need of support during this pandemic and it hasn't happened in the same way. And because we aren't in person, we haven't offered the Cutie Pie Cafe, but have collaborated and partnered with um, the SPAR Center in the Marin County to make sure that our students are aware of the resources and the spaces and groups that are happening there. Um, Welcome Week, I wanted to give folks a sense of what it's looked like in person. So we used to have about 200, 250 students participate every Welcome Week. Uh, it, but since we went into the pandemic, we've had about 25 to 40 overall. I'm saying that's a win because, you know, people are tapped out with Zoom, but people are still showing up. Comchella has been a huge success and I and kudos to T and Community Hour for really pulling this off. And again, we think about equity. Who are we highlighting? Who are we amplifying? So all of our artists have been folks of color with multiple identities. And so I want to name that we've been very intentional about that as well. And then trainings. We've offered uh, trainings to classes. We do ASCOM retreat and training every year. And then Flex, uh, my team, various folks on the team provide different Flex opportunities. And then we had our first LGBTQ plus Braver Space training for nursing this year, which I think was again, a really big win for us. ASCOM programming, I'll let you all look at that. Um, I wanted to highlight the transfer and the uh, career panel were our most popular events over the pandemic that ASCOM offered. And then basic needs, to give you a sense of just how many students we are serving and responding to. Do I have five minutes? You have five minutes. <laughs> okay, You're I keeping saw you track. on mute. You're keeping track. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm moving along. I hope I can get through all these. Um, we've received around 1,500 Calm Care reports since March, 2020. That gives you a sense of how large our load is and what we are lifting regularly. And then also just um, what our students are in need of. I'm gonna leave those numbers there, but I'm gonna move on because I wanna get through the rest of the slides. So who are, who are the people who's doing the work? What are our resources? Um, we are a staff of four. So we are doing the work and, and making sure we are supporting one another in that, in the programming and training. Our ASCOM board is absolutely fabulous. They show up, they do the programming, they put together you know, their heads, they put together extensive messaging uh, to support the many issues that are happening. We think about racial violence, um, most recently um, immigration and concerns around immigrant rights. Um, our SPAR Center, and then funding primarily comes from ASCOM and our Community Hour. And then the basic needs in calm care and conduct um, is myself and Matthew Kent, who is our student conduct officer. I want to make sure that I name that this collaborative process could not be possible for basic needs without SAS, the library IT, Dean of Academic Success Programs, Tanya Hirsch, Advancement, Keith Rosenthal, and then Dean of ES, um, Jonathan, Jonathan Hornet. And then our community partners, C4DP, CalFresh, and SparkPoint have been working with us for the last four years. Our funding is primarily from the Hunger Free Grant, but that has discontinued as of this year. The CARE Act funds an advancement, and it's important to note that there is no stable funding going forward for basic needs. We really piecemeal it together as needed. Um, additional resources, in turn, basic needs, we really need, you know, funding for this, for the food, technology, gift cards, and additional needs that come up in terms of personal needs. Ongoing funding source for the student emergency grant as well, because we don't know if the CARE Act will continue on beyond the pandemic. 
and then staffing staff support for building sustaining the basic needs initiative um, that was created as a hunger free grant we're not sure if that's going to come back from the chancellor's office and so looking at institutionalizing it would be critical alignment with common initiatives these are just some great pictures that we got to take over the years when we were in person uh, thinking about our nine point plan uh, through the president's office and idea and eeo so centering the healing collective care of black students staff and faculty advancing anti-racist affinity groups uh, providing proactive support for faculty our trainings and our outreach is often for us to be able to support our faculty to integrate how are we doing anti-racist teachings in the classrooms and supporting our students holistically participatory governance my team is on all is spread out and they bring the philosophy to these these governance committees so i wanted to name that equity and mental health we've had anisa sanchez rose uh, anisa sanchez rose has come to our ASCOM meetings regularly now to really talk with our students to hear and take in their insights and then uei instead of listing a lot i wanted to highlight accomplishments by showing you all pictures um, these are a bunch of the programs that have gone off both in person and uh, virtually and these are the students behind it and so we have a new group of students as well but i wanted to make sure you got to see our students in this presentation and that of up or right hand corner that is showing that technology is definitely getting handed out and our students are utilizing it our greatest challenges Student engagement more is right now, um, getting our students to come to the programs and also feel like they're involved in the campus community. That has been hard. Uh, we do a lot of social media outreach and that has been our primary levels of engagement. Staffing, um, and, and that's particularly for thinking out about basic needs and, and doing that long-term and then funding for basic needs as well. And our vision for, and future directions. It's really around ensuring our programming events and basic needs that they're in line. I okay, thank you in line with our national uh, community college and then comms equity agenda. And it's around amplifying the voices and needs of our marginalized communities. Um, when we think about white supremacy and we think about racism and we think about oppression, it really is about muting these voices and these experiences. And so the hope is through the programming that we do, through what we offer and through the collaborations, this is what we do is to make sure that these are the communities that are being lifted up. Create sustainable plans, including staffing and funding. And again, this is really in relation to the basic needs distribution, developing programs and events that connect with UEI that combat racism and oppression. And then building deeper connections um, and engagement with the learning communities. We already do this, but T has really done quite a bit of outreach because we wanna do this more, not just virtually, but when we get in person. And then more trainings and uh, presentations, evaluating accessibility of pro programs and contents when we think about um, students with disabilities and everybody when we think about universal design. And then finally, social media and ongoing tools for education and dissemination of information. And I'm afraid that brings us to time. That's okay. I made a list. So you can just look at that list. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Again, that list will be in the OneDrive. Thank you. Excellent presentation and excellent work. And I would be remiss given where we've been the last 12 months not to really thank you all for your work in the, in the basic needs area in the calm cares area. Again, I could thank you very much. Great work. Uh, kudos to these folks in, in student activities and advocacy. And I know there's been some great uh, kudos that are showing up in the chat room. So here's where we're at, folks. We have one last 15 minute presentation. And then I'm going to make some just the uh, closing comments, maybe two or three minutes worth. And then we will be done for the day. But last but certainly not least, we have our last presentation of um, the Emoja and the Emoja Equity Institute. And so I'm going to ask uh, Professor Turner to introduce his team. So thank everyone for being here today. It's a, it's a great, I want to give my uh, kudos out for the, uh, all those who were involved in the organizing of uh, College of Marin's first equity summit. And I want to repeat something which I repeated at the well attended convocation, which was uh, headed up with uh, trap the vote. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And that's the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King speaking at the Great March on Washington in 1963. Uh, and there is the urgency of now. I wanna thank President Kuhn, the administrative uh, uh, team for uh, putting together the, uh, for, the Marin, for this equity summit. 
Uh, my name is Professor Walter Turner. I'm the coordinator of the Emoja Learning Community on the staff of the Emoja Equity Institute. Uh, and you'll hear at some point in this particular presentation from Dr. Yashika Crawford, uh, who will be talking specifically about the Emoja Equity Institute. When we greet in the Emoja community, the first thing we say is Swabona, uh, which is a Zulu word, which I, means I see you. And it means more than just I see you. Uh, it's more than just a word of politeness. Uh, uh, it carries the importance of recognizing the worth and dignity of each person. Uh, and when you say words like swabona, you say words like emoja, you essentially hold one hand and you hold the hand of the other person. So you take a moment really to recognize their dignity and to recognize their worth. The emoja community, uh, which is a key Swahili word, which means uh, unity, uh, is a community and critical resource dedicated to enhancing the cultural and educational experiences of African Americans and other students. Um, the Emoja is a statewide uh, institution. I currently serve on the executive board of the Emoja statewide uh, community. Uh, there are over 65 campuses um, serving about 10,000 students since 2006. Uh, currently serving about 6,000 students annually. Uh, the Emoja statewide community has trained uh, over 1,000 faculty and staff over the last five or six years. And at College of Marin, I'm particularly proud, we're particularly proud uh, that we have continued to graduate uh, African-American students and students who are part of the Emoja program at just an outstanding uh, rate, increasing from 11 or 12, two or three years ago to 13 to 14 to 15. Uh, you can see the slide in front of us, which is the Emoja Learning Community uh, history. Uh, and without going through all the details, essentially the founding of Emoja uh, at the College of Marin, the founding of the mentoring project at the College of Marin was based on this concept that comes from the Othering and Belonging Institute uh, at UC Berkeley. I mean, we were finding that African-American students were, were othered, that they were not being given agency. And Professor Early spoke eloquently at the Board of Trustees meeting about how some events uh, at the Black Student Union Conference in Virginia in 1989, um, the recruitment of African-American basketball players, uh, and then beginning of a process of Marin City Night, and a number of uh, situations that we did to make sure the people in the Marin City community, the Nevada, the San Rafael um, communities were also informed. I think we often think that uh, all of the African-American community is in Marin City, and that's not the case. Professor Tur uh, Early is really responsible uh, for establishing the mentoring program, which came before the official Emoja program that you see, which is now statewide. Uh, so uh, she was one of the spark plugs uh, for the mentoring project, which began before 2000. So we had a lot of unofficial Emoja activities, and then we began to move into official Emoja program about five years ago. The Emoja is aligned with the Educational Master Plan Strategic Plan, 2019-2025 Educational Master Plan, as well as the 2019-2022 Strategic Plan with an intentional focus on equity-mindedness and providing an institutional body which seeks to address the following, to eliminate racial equity gaps and to reduce access and barriers to student goals. Emoja is committed to the academic success, personal growth, and self-actualization of Black, African-American, and all students, meaning that we believe that when the voices of students are, made, are heard intentionally uh, and that there is space in the institution, uh, that there are no limits to the success. Uh, many of our students who have graduated have gone on to HBCUs. Uh, some of the students have come back and played a role in Emoja. Uh, but there are Emoja graduate students all around the United States and all around the world uh, who have graduated from the College of Marin uh, under the wings of the Emoja program. Uh, the weekly breakfast, which I particularly enjoy myself, the community events, uh, we've had events which have uh, been rooted in the Marin City community and the larger campus community. Uh, we have a woman to woman group, um, which has some exciting programs which will be coming up this month and has a, a exciting series of programs on financial literacy, on being depressed while black, of being a single mother, uh, those type of things, which have really given skills to our students to be able to survive. College and conference trip, a link with HUM 101, counseling and resources. 
I do want to mention as we flip the side uh, that uh, Angela Davis was uh, here a couple of years ago. Uh, it was interesting because some people said they didn't come because they couldn't believe there was a real Angela Davis. Angela Davis was on our campus. Uh, Erica Huggins was on our campus. And you see our funding there for the Emoja Learning Community. Uh, much of that comes from uh, statewide uh, uh, educational achievement funds. Um, that is categorical funds. We've also been very, very creative in applying to the Emoja statewide program and getting funds for emergency student fund, for peer mentors, and also for speakers. Additional resources in need. Institutionalized administrative assistant. This is absolutely a priority uh, need. Dedicated Emoja village space in the new building equal or greater to the previous uh, learning resource center space, computers, printers, social space, and Emoja office space to be able to conduct. You see photos there. You see uh, Professor Katrina King in the front there, who is the regional representative of statewide Emoja, who's been extremely supportive uh, with College of Marin. Alignment with other initiatives and program, the student equity plan, eliminate racial equity gaps, as well as enter the path, stay on the path, and ensure learning. We were always having African-American students coming to College of Marin, but we didn't have a mechanism that was allowing them to stay on the path and to ensure learning and to be able to graduate and reach those goals. And with some of the things I hear today, I'm certainly much more confident we're, we're turning that corner. Highlights the transfer agreements with the HBCUs, uh, COVID emergency support fund, the uh, Moja Village, the student leadership development, which is a key part of our work, uh, special events, speaker series, and uh, community events. And uh, we have such a full calendar for uh, Black History Month, we had to move some away. We have a full calendar coming up in March, et cetera, and some other very, very exciting programs. One of the things I'm most excited about is some of the work that's happening around the wilderness uh, part of our course with H uh, HUM 101 which is about uh, uh, Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color, and access to land and access to wilderness. The need for administrative support is the uh, greatest challenge that we're looking forward and keeping going here with the next slide. Uh, the vision, the develop student mentoring program in conjunction with partner learning communities, uh, connecting students with internships. I want to thank Paul Dobmeyer uh, and those in the science area for supporting that. Uh, Professor Nino, develop African-American male leadership program um, and continue to develop culturally relevant offerings for African-American students, not just in the ethnic studies department, but around the College of Marin campus. And also very, very proud of our uh, collaborations with the physical education department. Uh, we had the highest GPA of uh, students, many of them attached to the uh, College of Marin Emoja program. And opportunities for collaboration, as you can see, the list is, is endless uh, here. And uh, some of our good allies and friends that we work with, you see their name here, and we will continue to collaborate uh, going forward. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, turn it over. As you see there, that's trapped to vote. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Yashika Crawford to talk about the Emoja Equity Institute. We have about six minutes. Yes, sir. I, I got the time right on the nose. So <laughs> sincere appreciations to all of you. It just really warms my heart to hear about so many of the amazing work that's going on on campus. Um, without question, College of Marin is really leading the efforts to inspire and instill and support our students. Uh, however, the, the purpose uh, of uh, why we all uh, are surrounded around this idea of, of equity. It didn't happen just by happenstance, but happened because of something happening. And it was egregious. And it uh, called and raised the alarm of us deciding, no, this is where the buck stops. We are uh, have to do something. And so in the summer of 2020, in response to the chancellor's office call to address equity. It was President Kuhn's nine point plan. It was the voice of Black Lives Mattering. There was a proposal that was created uh, through so many of the talented folks of Emoja that wanted to systematically address racial equity. And so we were so happy uh, through the leadership of uh, President Kuhn that the College of Marin announced 
the launch of the Yamoja Equity Institute. And so this is a collaboration of not just Yamoja, but all of our valuable partners on campus to provide Yamoja inspired training and learning activities to advance the agendas of equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in our communities. And so this will serve as our central hub in the development of innovative programs and services and complement the mission of the Moran Community College District. We have four areas of focus uh, for the uh, Yamoja Equity Institute, which includes the faculty's community and practice, the mental health equity lens, the high school to calm pipeline, and the classified grow your own. These are the focus areas which allows us as a community at College of Moran to center all of our efforts in terms of ensuring that we're all going in the same direction. Briefly want to highlight the faculty communities of practice, again, is in collaboration of some of our partners, such as Academic Senate, UPM, our Professional Learning Committee, uh, to advance that equity-minded and anti-racist classroom practices, encouraging spaces where faculty can collaborate and learn from each other, thereby promoting professional growth for all of us. Our Grow Your Own Classified Professionals is extending our opportunity to work alongside Professional Learning Committee and Classified Senate and CSEA in order to support our classified professionals with accessing really great uh, opportunities for learning. High School to Calm Pipeline, our uh, amazing opportunity to work with our partners uh, connected with our K-12 communities to not only increase the transition of high school students, but to work with our local community partners to enhance our educational services to African-American community, while also providing opportunities for members of College of Marin's community to access the community and in the expertise that they have. Lastly, we are so happy about our equity and mental health series, our collaboration with psychological services, which you've already heard about, which is providing a lot of a, a, an abundance of support in collaboration with our community partners with addressing the need to implement, develop, and support mental health programming for students of color. Our alignment with the Ed Master Plan and Strategic Plan is lockstep. In fact, it was with its inception that we want to ensure that it not only was addressing the Ed Master Plan, but the Strategic Plan uh, as highlighted here. In terms of services and resources, right now we are functioning on awesome sweat equity from an amazing group of talented persons, but the goal and the hope is to uh, access some resources in the amount of about $145,000, as well as secure space in our new uh, building in order to amplify and support the work ahead. These are some of the other initiatives that we are aligned with. Uh, not only is it the student equity plan, but guided pathways, but also the chancellor's office vision for success, as well as Dr. Kuhn's nine point plan for equity. Some of the highlights and accomplishments. We just launched this uh, summer and so many of us on this screen has greatly influenced the development of the Equity Institute and sincere appreciations to all of you because without you, this can't work, this can't move. And that's why College of Marin is ready. But from the summer to now, we have already been identified as a statewide model for how a, a college can do the same thing. And so we're super excited by the opportunity to share the best practices that we've learned just already. We've had a host of engagement opportunities that consisted of not only campus-wide community engagement planning sessions. We've had a really amazing opportunity to bring in Trap the Boat, the voices from our community in order to talk about what it is Did we lose Dr. Crawford? Just froze. We're about one minute. Uh, Professor Turner, would you want to close it? Yeah, I close can it out? close it if she's if she's frozen. But I, I think she was. Uh, uh, Professor Crawford was talking about the amazing opportunities and the breakout sessions that came from the uh, from the trap the vote uh, convocation and the breakout sessions. Uh, the breakout session on Friday was attended about 40 or 45 different people. So some of the greatest challenges, which would be the next part we were gonna go into, are the alignment of college marine equity efforts, the duplication, avoiding the duplication of efforts, the assessment of progress towards uh, equity goals. Making an assessment is important. 
Uh, all of us have done work in silos before, but we need to be able to assess where we're going, assuring consistency in defining equity and guiding practices, future directions, the launching the faculty committees, uh, aligning operational definitions and assessment, uh, mental health, and organizing college marine outreach uh, efforts. So, so those are some of the directions that we're going with the Emoja Equity Institute. And I think we're just about at the edge of, of time. And we've spoken about this before. Uh, and we look forward to this as an institutional umbrella for the College of Marin. Thank you very much, uh, President Kuhn. And sincere appreciations by that. Apparently, I just had a power trip in my house. <laughs> and so the so revolution will be televised. Today, that so was on purpose. Great. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you both for great presentations and great work. Uh, we look forward to supporting both initiatives and looking forward to seeing where the Institute goes. So kudos to our uh, Moja colleagues. And I lost my chat box here. Uh, but that's OK. Let's show your appreciation in the chat box for them as well. Uh, if possible, can we bring up Karen Chan's graphic recording as I'm making my, my closing uh, remarks here? Uh, first of all, I have to say that today has exceeded my hopes and expectations. I truly exceeded my hopes and expectations. I've you know, been motivated, inspired. I'm just so proud of all of you, all of us, for this incredible work that we're doing. And I see such potential and possibilities uh, for moving forward. One of the clear outcomes that I hope to see is a web page that features all of this work, right? So that if I'm a prospective student or a prospective employee, I can go in, on the College of Marin website and look for equity and find descriptions and connections and visuals of all of this amazing work that, that we're doing. Because I think that we would be uh, really doing ourselves um, a great benefit to be able to help our students see what we're all about and help our future employees see what we're all about as well. Um, where we go from here? That's a you know, question that I don't actually know the answer to because um, I actually want to engage you in that, in that question. And we'll be sending out a little survey about any feedback that you might have about how today went. Um, but really, where do we go from here? Do we do this once or twice a year? What's the format? I know 15 minutes was awfully con con constraining for some. Uh, do we spread it over two days rather than one? Or you know, in an ideal world, we would have been together and perhaps it could have been an all-day event. Uh, so, you know, my sincere thanks and appreciation to all the presenters. Each of the presentations clearly reflected a lot of heart and soul and a lot of preparation. People, folks really took this seriously, and I greatly appreciate that. So I want to ask you, as we did coming into the day, um, I ask everybody to put one word into the, about how you were feeling about the day coming up. And now that we've actually experienced a good part of the day, uh, if possible, you could go in and just put a word in there about how you're feeling the day went. We will be uh, capturing the chat, um, the, the text of the chat for the use in the future. And again, reminding folks that we have created this uh, OneDrive document where all this information that was presented actually will be in a text version in there so that we can go and use that information and, and massage it and see, um, uh, again, where we go from here. So with that, I wanna thank um, our closed captioner who we don't have a name on, and that's intentional. Uh, Karen Shan, the great artwork. I look forward to seeing this in person and seeing how we might use this image. To all of our presenters, to, um, to Jesse and Nicole and everybody else behind the scenes. And I think then um, all of our participants. We had a good number of participants that weren't presenters that stayed with us all day. So with that, we're only about 14 minutes behind schedule and that's not bad. So everybody have a great weekend. I appreciate you uh, and stay healthy and take good care.